Hello and welcome. Good morning to all attendees. Hello. Um, our second day's first section will uh, deal with the Orthodian and Brechtian aspects uh, of Robert Rosen's aesthetic. And it is my great honor to introduce our first speaker today, Marcus Wessendorf. Uh, Marcus is the president uh, of uh, the International Brecht Society, uh, the editor of uh, the Brecht Yearbook, and the chair of the Department of uh, Theatre and Dance at the uh, University of Hawaii. Uh, he translated and directed plays and worked as a dramaturg, and now he will uh, share his insight on Stefan Brecht uh, Theatre of Visions from a Brechtian perspective. Okay, so for convenience sake, I will refer to Robert Wilson, Stefan Brecht, and Bertolt Brecht by their first names in this presentation. When Bertolt and his wife Helena Weigel returned to Europe from the Californian exile in 1947, the son Stefan stayed in the United States. After getting a PhD in philosophy from Harvard for a dissertation on Hegel, teaching philosophy at the University of Miami, and pursuing postdoctoral studies on Hegel and Marx in Paris, Stefan settled in New York City in the mid-1960s, where he got involved in the experimental theater scene. Apart from writing poetry and publishing it in German and English, his most ambitious project was to document the original theater of the city of New York from the mid-60s to the mid-70s in a series of books. Out of 10 books of a planned series, he only completed three. Uh, the Theater of Visions, Robert Wilson, which was first produced by the West German publisher of his father's work, Zorkamp, in 1978. Queer Theater, with chapters about Jack Smith, The Theater of the Ridiculous, Andy Warhol, John Waters, and others, also first published by Zorkamp in 1978. And two volumes on Peter Schumann's Bread and Puppet Theater, first published in 1987 by Methuen, the British publishing house of his father's work. NYU's Fales Library now holds the Stefan Brecht papers. Stefan performed in several of Bob's productions, for example, The Life and Times of Sigmund Freud in 1969, Overture in 1972, and The Letter for Queen Victoria in 1974. In the Theater of Visions, he covers Bob's work from the late 1960s to 1977, and he very much distinguishes two periods in Bob's work, the early image-driven pieces, including The King of Spain, the Life and Times of Sigmund Freud, Deathman Glands, Overture, Ter Mountain and Gardenia Terrace, and The Life and Times of Joseph Stalin, and the later ones, in which Bob also experimented with language, including A Letter for Queen Victoria, The Dollar Value of Man, A Spaceman, Einstein on the Beach, and I was sitting on my patio, this guy appeared, I thought I was hallucinating. My focus in the following will be on Stefan's description and analysis of the key aesthetic characteristics and underlying assumptions of the first period and on the production of Deathman Glance in particular, to which Stefan dedicates almost 90 pages. As a performer in and spectator of Bob's early pieces, Stefan was in a privileged position to write about Bob's work. Since Bob himself, different from some of his peers in the New York theater scene, did not articulate his own vision and approach in writing, the theater of visions also filled the gap, even though it represented Stefan's point of view, not Bob's. Although Stefan makes a few direct references to his father and his father's theatrical concepts, many of his reflections and observations resonate with Berthold's theories, and that despite the fact that Bob did not work with dr dramatic text at this stage and was less overtly interested in politics uh, than many of his contemporaries in experimental theater. I'm interested in drawing out the resonances between Berthold's theories and Stefan Stefan's texts, also because other scholars and critics partially because of Heiner Müller's mediation, later identified and discussed Bertolt Brechtian features in Bob's work, and Bob himself later directed Be uh, Bertolt's The Ocean Flight and the Three Penny Opera at the Berlin Ensemble. I will start with those of Stefan's observations that point to formal similarities between his father's work and Bob's before also discussing the respective, respective significance of these formal features in the different conceptual frameworks of Bertolt's theater th theory on the one hand and Stefan's theorization of Bob's theater of visions on the other. Both Bertolt and the early Bob reject the conventions and entertainment function of regular theater 
and both widely employ what Bertolt calls the Fremdungseffekte or estrangement effect, that is theatrical devices and techniques to render seemingly familiar and ordinary objects, actions, or persons strange and therefore alterable. Berthold aimed for a radical separation of elements, that is of words, music, design, etc., in his epic theater, and Stefan des describes Bob's theater in comparable terms, quote, in a, in a disassociated manner, various events occur, conventions of representation are played off against one another, unquote. The structure of Berthold's plays is episodic and characterized by a dramaturgy of interruption to maintain the spectator's focus on the moment-to-moment -moment development of the plot instead of its outcome. Stefan characterizes Stefan Glantz as a spectacle that is, quote, divided into movements by a radical stop and go, unquote, and he states that Bob's, quote, figurations are discrete. He neither leads into them nor out of them, unquote. Both Bertolt and Bob favor a detached, unemotional, relaxed, and observant attitude of the performers towards their own performance on stage. Bertolt, for example, using classical Chinese theater as a model, writes about the actor in that tradition that, quote, he expresses that he knows that he's being watched, unquote, and that he observes himself and his arms and legs while performing specific gestures and poses. Bob as a performer, according to Stefan, in his, in his uh, own productions, quote, never seems tense, but seems continually aware of the whereabouts of every part of his body seeming to relate to these parts. He leaves no doubt that as he stands there, he is conscious of himself as a performer, unquote. For Bertolt and the early Bob alike, the performer's relationship towards their performance is also supposed to instill a similarly observant relationship to the performance in the spectator. Bertolt appreciates about classical Chinese theater that the audience identifies itself with the actor not through emotional identification, but, quote, as being an observer and accordingly develops the attitude of observing or looking on, unquote. He himself, he, Bertolt himself, wants to prevent the spectators from emotionally engaging with the plot and from feeling empathy for the characters to further their critical attitude towards both. Bob's early productions, according to Stefan, were deliberately unemotional, also because Bob wanted his performers to enable the spectators to relax. Quote, conventional theater's ostentatious indications of acting on being affected by another, unquote, were absent. Bertolt coins the term complex vision for the audience's ability to simultaneously think along with their place actions while also thinking about them at the meta level. In his productions, this double vision was facilitated by projections on screens, half curtains overlaying bare of the technical apparatus. According to Stefan, the experience of watching Bob Stefan Glantz was also, quote, pervasively dual. We are watching images and performers creating those images, unquote. Bertolt was known for an open-ended creative process where texts were rarely ever definitely com completed, but worked on and revised over several decades, often resulting, for example, in different versions of his plays. Stefan mentions that, quote, wholeness is not an ideal of Bob, but bothers him, unquote. In his early productions, Bob frequently reused material from other projects, the life and times of Sigmund Freud repeating material from the King of Spain, the life and times of Joseph Stalin combining most of Freud, with parts of Desmond Glantz and come out in Gardenia, Paris, etc. Different from his assessment of the bread and puppet theater in his later publication, Stefan emphasizes repeatedly in the theater of visions that Bob's theater is irrelevant to the audience's real life social interests and concerns outside of the theater. It is therefore interesting that Stefan himself provides a Marxist analysis of one aspect of Desmond Glantz. The construction of three horizontally lined up wooden bins by several performers on stage, which goes on for a long time. Once these bins have been completed, they just stand there empty bef before they're finally filled in. Stefan argues that the ordinariness of the staged image of constructing the bins juxtaposed with other images on stage invites the spectator, quote, to identify it with the chief horror of industrial capitalism in his own life, the alienation of labor, unquote. Bertolt aimed for a mise-en-scene that would bring out what he called the gestus of each character. By gestus, a combination of a gist and gesture, he meant the social relations and attitudes of a character as physically expressed and externalized through gestures, facial expression, posture, vocal patterns, etc. As a repeatable and quotable sign revealing the social positionality of a character, the gestus needed to be legible. Bob also, according to Stefan, told the actors in his early performances, quote, 
to aim at the production of a clear image, one that reads well, unquote. However, Bob stage images pulled from his unconscious and deliberately not interpreted by him need to be clearly legible as strikingly enigmatic images, as symbols that even though they are, quote, carrying symbol function, do not function as symbols, unquote, and mean nothing. Stefan doesn't use the words, but he very much analyzes the gestos of the members of the Bert Hoffman School of Birds. Quote, birds, generally white Protestants from upper middle class families are reserved people, superficially cool and offhand, rather carefully controlled in their conduct with unexpressive faces and voices, generally well-read and informed and college graduates. They tend to be nonverbal with few opinions, careful to avoid abstract terms or generalizations, unquote. Both Bertolt and Bob develop what, what could be called theater pedagogies in response to the alienation inscribed on the body through capitalist and bourgeois socialization. Bertolt developed Lehrstücke, learning plays, that were conceived of as training pieces for the self-orientation of participating performers, often amateurs. By isolating, enacting, and criticizing specific postures and gestures related to class conflict and power structures, the participants could learn to perform them differently and recognize, deconstruct, and refashion their own socially shaped social gestos and attitudes. Bob's weekly movement workshops with the amateur performers of this Bert Hoffman School of Birds can be understood as a deconditioning of their gestos as described by Stefan by alleviating the socially conditioned fear of, quote, acknowledging one's identity with one's body, unquote. Stefan writes, quote, participating in Bob's sessions, one realizes that a specific inhibition underlies the common sense, decency, economy of normal adult movement, an objectless fear, felt impermanency. So regular a state of muscular inhibition, one is not conscious of it, unquote. Stefan implies that Bob, also based on his earlier work with children, is invested in the personal liberation of the stunted or repressed vital energies of children that has been killed off physically and spiritually by family and society. Stefan's own participation in Bob's sessions left him with a quote, certain appreciable, rather lasting elation and increased ease, unquote, with his own body. One of Stefan's claims about Bob's early work is that his original theatrical intention was probably for individuals to reveal themselves. By individuals, Stefan does, doesn't mean the integrated, undivided self of what he calls the bourgeois epoch, but a human being in a state of becoming in a constant process of self-actualization that no longer has an identity in the era of, quote, bureaucratization and proletarianization, unquote. The notion echoes Berthold's divisual, which is divisible because it always belongs to several collectives at the same time. Stefan argues that, quote, the awareness of the performer's individuality in Bob's theater replaces the awareness of a personality or of a character represented by an actor, unquote. However, the spectator becomes aware of the performer's individualities, not because Bob's direction highlights and isolates specific performers as extraordinary, but because his performers move without a concern about appearances, uh, easily following their own body's kinetic impulses while being sensitive and attuned to the movements of the other performers on stage. Stefan describes the counterintuitive effect that despite Bob's encouragement of his performers not to show themselves as individuals on stage, quote, a powerful communication of individualities results, unquote. Similar to Berthold's epic theater, uh, the spectators, quote, not the performers, have to be the active party, unquote, in Bob's production. However, Stefan applies a predominantly psychological vocabulary to describe the attention-raising and expanding processes in Bob's work that would have been alien to his father. Whereas Berthold's goal is to turn his audiences into critical spectators, who translate their awareness of the social issues represented on stage into political action beyond the theater, the early Bob, according to Stefan, is interested in, an, in awareness, not as a cognitive and intellectual, but a pre as well as unconscious sensory and creative potential to be fully, liber uh, to be fully actualized. Quote, looking becomes imagination, unquote. Bob's productions liberate our awareness by eroding our perceptual acquisitiveness 
relaxing our analytic, identifying retentive propen propensities and bypassing the ego structure of perception. Bob's work provides, quote, a loosening up ex exercise for the mind, unquote. And the free movement of awareness encouraged by this exercise makes, quote, awareness itself a medium of enjoyment and even awareness, unquote. This brings to mind Friedrich Schiller's notion of art as providing the highest enjoyment defined as the, quote, freedom of the spirit and the vivacious play of all its powers, unquote. Except that in Bob's theater, the transformation of the sensory world into a free creation of the spirit is not about controlling the material world through ideas, as in Schiller's case. Bob's early theater is thoroughly grounded in the body, not in ideas or idealism, but also not in Berthold's materialism, and that applies to the notion of awareness as well. Even the loosening up exercise for the mind that the Wilson production provides to the spectator is, quote, of the same sort as the physical free motion exercises by which Bob trains and prepares his performance, unquote. Stefan argues that, quote, somewhat like spectators in normal theater who may emphatically share the feelings of characters, unquote, the spectators in Bob's theater mimetically share in the performers, quote, group aware bodily self-awareness, unquote. In Bob's work, the audience becomes aware of their awareness not as an act of intellectual recognition or self-reflection, but, quote, as an energetic state of participation, unquote. One key to stimulating and liberating the audience's awareness in Bob's early theater, according to Stefan, is the dream logic and content of his images. The presence of fantasy elements, the show's composition out of images, uh, the manner of development, etc. The cumulative effect, especially of the enigmatic characters in Death and Glance, quote, suggests the presence of emblems in life, which carry purpose and true meaning indifferent to us and not to be comprehended by us, unquote. Different from Freudian psychoanalysis, however, quote, the dream is uninterpretable. Life is a language without denotation, unquote. This notion is closer to Franz Kafka in Antonin Artaud uh, than to Berthold. Stefan argues that, quote, Wilson's theater is dreamlike because it makes us suspend the reality principles of waking consciousness, unquote, including the principles of discontinuity and uniformity. Bob's theater is closer to sleeping consciousness because it doesn't, quote, assume that before something can be something else, it must have ceased to be what it is, unquote. Instead, quote, we perceive things changing into other things, from moment to moment and place to place, one form goes into and turns out another, unquote. Berthold, with his materialist dialectical as well as Taoist outlook, also strongly embraces the possibility of change at any given moment, but, it, but as a discontinuous change from one set and established state to another. One example would be his poem, Everything Changes, which begins with the lines, quote, a new beginning, it's possible with your last breath, but what happened, happened. And the water you poured into the wine, you can no longer pour out, unquote. A new beginning is always possible, but based on the acknowledgement of the determinate earlier state left behind. According to Stefan, sleeping consciousness conceives of dream objects in varying modes of non-identity. The identity of individuals, acts, events, or situations in dreams is either over or underdetermined, but rarely self-identical. In one passage, he refers to his father as an example of the over or underdetermined identity of the dream object typical for the sleeping consciousness and for, for uh, Bob's work. Quote, when I meet my father in my dream, I have no doubt of his identity, but at the same time, there's nothing about my identification that would preclude that figure from not only being something else, but from not being my father, unquote. The indeterminate identity of Berthold in his son's dream makes him a figure more likely to appear in Bob's theater than in his own, which Stefan seems to equate with conventional theater. Quote, whereas conventional theater so fashions the appearances acted out as to suggest real people whose, whose appearances they are and to which through the appearance, appearances we are to relate, Wilson's theater makes us relate to the appearance, appearances created only in themselves as phenomena 
and so fashions them that we perceive them as, as possibly other alternatives, intrinsically ambiguous, of multiple identity, non-self-identical, as definitely incomplete and inconsistent, unquote. Even though Berthold also rejects the illusionism of realism and the audience's engagement with supposedly real people qua identification with their appearances, he equally rejects the Nietzschean reduction of the phenomenal world to mere appearance. Bertolt wants his audience to become aware of and interrogate the appearances created by capitalism, not as phenomena without any underlying material reality, but as disguises of an economic system effectively concealing its mode of operation. His individual, also by default, involves incomplete and inconsistent multiple and non-self identities, but they result from social, not unconscious forces and processes and are discontinuous and separate, not in flux and morphing into each other. In any case, Stefan's dream example here can be understood as a critique of his father's notion of the indeterminacy of identity as not going far enough. Overall, both Bob's and Bertolt's theater about the rejection of the world as it is. Stefan repeatedly states that Bob's theater in a utopian sense, quote, makes us feel that anything might happen, unquote. And according to Bertolt, quote, things won't stay as they are, unquote. Both Bob's and Bertolt's work are about the liberation from oppression, but they may mean different things by it. Uh, one other concept of Bertolt, for example, is the notion of fable or fable as a dialectically interpreted plot made playable for a modern audience. Even though Stefan concedes that Bob's early spectacles only have a, have a fable to the extent that it has been fully subverted into imagery, uh, these spectacles still reflect a particular viewpoint, namely that of a, quote, self-contained boy child autistic in the eyes of an adult world, unquote. And that boy's suppressed rage. Berthold's theater, by comparison, is about the liberation from the oppression of a capitalist system. And if one could say that his plays are also motivated by an emotion, however deflected or estranged, it would be the anger at social injustice and exploitation, but in a less personal, more rationalized way. Most of the formal similarities of Bob's early work with Berthold's theater aesthetics also continued in Bob's later work and often became even more pronounced. The separation of elements, the use of interruption, the clarity of gestures and stage compositions, the quotation of elements from earlier productions and later ones, etc. Collaboration, always a key aspect of Berthold's work, was already important in Bob's early productions but became even more relevant and wide ranging later on. Even after he began directing classical and modern plays and working with professional actors, dramaturgs, and playwrights, often in Europe, um, Bob not only continued to use and expand his expen extensive repertoire of estranging staging techniques, but also to push them further than Berthold ever did. Thank you. Thank you so much. Questions or comments to Marcus? Thank you so much for that, Marcus. I think you did a really astounding job of sort of differentiating Bertolt Brecht's aesthetics with Robert Wilson's, and I wonder if you could talk about how that then merges or doesn't merge in something like Wilson's directing of Three Penny for the Berliner in 2011 and, and other work on Brecht's plays. So I would say that if you look at uh, his production at, of, of Three Penny uh, Opera at uh, the Lille Ensemble, I think 2007, uh, 2008, uh, of course, I mean, he, he, he estranges um, that p play even, even more than kind of Brecht, uh, Brecht kind of intended in terms of, I mean, the, the kind of trademark Brechtian, uh, the trademark kind of Wilsonian kind of techniques that are kind of inserted into the staging. I mean, you know, one, one key feature of many of, of, of Bob's productions, of course, are actors, you know, turning their back towards the audience. I mean, that's the basically how the entire production starts with Mackie Messer basically, you know, uh, we, we see Mackie Messer at the beginning of, of this production turning the back to, to the audience and only kind of gradually kind of turning around. So then there are many, many elements. When, yeah, I mean, we're in a certain way, you know, <laughs> I mean, 
I mean, the Wilsonian uh, aesthetics and, and, and Brechtian aesthetics really kind of overlap. It doesn't feel like, I don't know, you know, I mean, I, I, what I took away from this production was, was a certain affinity between both styles. I mean, the style inherent in three penny uh, opera already, and then how kind of, uh, you know, Wilson kind of tackles it. And, and of course, the other element that, 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 he, uh, that he does is, of course, that, that, that the uh, actors for most of the, uh, for most of the performance, of course, face, face the audience more or less directly. There, there's very little, in, you know, uh, very little eye contact between uh, the, the characters for most of the, for most of the uh, production. You mentioned the dream problem, and it came to my mind if the Brecht's books <laughs> had any connection with the surrealist movement. Breton uh, uh, and also Aragon and others were deeply immersed in the dream problem, and it, they thought it's an absolutely central uh, component of any artistic creativity. So uh, was there any connection? Yesterday I asked this from Bob, but he avoided the answer to that. I mean, I mean, I mean, uh, you know, you could say that for some of some of Brecht's early work, uh, I mean, the, you know, the film that he worked on with Carl Valentin has kind of surrealist elements, and of course, in, in his early works, he had strong kind of expressionist elements. But I would say, I mean, Brecht, for example, was not inter interested in Freud or psychology or psych psychoanalysis at all. Um, and if there is a connection to, let's say, kind of surreal surrealism, it would be only very indirectly through Walter Benjamin, of course, who wrote extensively about surrealism. Yeah, I mean, there, 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 there's this kind of connection. Of course, Kafka obviously is not a surrealist, but, but raises kind of similar questions like the surrealist did. And uh, Brecht also, you know, had kind of issues with Benjamin's, you know, strong uh, affinity basically with, with, with Kafka's work. So I don't, I don't think there is a very strong connection. Um. Yeah. I mean, I, I said, yeah, the early pieces. In I mean, the early kind of pieces, I think there is yeah. a quite strong connection between surrealism. Precisely, exactly. Thank you, that was really fascinating. And as someone who has read Stefan Brecht's Hero Visions from beginning to end, I completely, I, I applaud your, the challenge of trying to make sense out of it. I mean, if you haven't read it, I think Berthold and Stefan as writers are the complete opposite, right? Berthold is very concise and precise and, and Stefan is just so overwritten and it's really hard sometimes to make sense out of the very, very long passages where he tries to articulate his thinking. And I sometimes have a feeling that he also contradicts himself quite a lot, which you also sort of refer to it or alludes to that in your presentation. So I was sort of wondering if you could say something maybe about how it was to work on these materials and to try to sort of, or, or whether you saw any contradictions when you come to things. So, so I have to say that I actually, I bought Stefan Brecht's Theater of Visions when I was an exchange student at the Graduate Center, when it was still on 42nd Street in 1988-89, I bought it at a small bookstore, uh, you know, in the Broadway district, and I had a very hard time reading it. I actually hated reading it, <laughs> um, and I still think it's probably one of one of the the, the least copy edited uh, edited <laughs> books on a contemporary theater ever, <laughs> and 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 and, and, I, and I don't think that. He would have been able to publish it if it wouldn't have been the publisher, uh, the West German publisher of his father's work. And, and of course, I mean, the, I, so, so one issue is also you have a, Germ a German publisher publishing this, uh, you know, English text written by, I don't know, of course, American or kind of German-American and not particularly great fluid English. Um, so, so when, when I read this in the, in, in the late 80s, I, you know, I felt it was completely um, rambling, ranting, poorly edited, footnotes that go on for many, many pages. 
I, I just felt like there was no, there was no clear structure. There, there was literally no, he, you know, he just kind of submitted a, a poorly edited manuscript to the publisher and they, they published it without any kind of, you know, review process. Um, but it's all, but, but even then, um, even at the time when I, when I read it, uh, there was this other impression that I had of some really kind of in-depth phenomenological and philosophical uh, points that he was making about uh, Bob's, Bob's work. Um, and I still think that's, that's the major strength actually of Stefan Brecht's uh, book, that, that you know, he, he, I mean he really kind of, uh, I mean, they're, they're lengthy passages on you know, uh, individuality versus personality in Bob's work. Uh, they also perhaps kind of problematic uh, uh, reflections on insanity in Bob's work. From a 2024 perspective, they're very problematic uh, statements on, um, he has a certain obsession with the appearance of lesbians in, in, in Bob's early productions. I mean, you know, I mean they're, they're really kind of, um, he uses problematic language when it comes to, I don't know, neurodiversity. Um, and of course, he often doesn't um, shy away from seemingly very personal attacks on Bob's work. So, so I focus on the first part because I mean, on, on, on what he identifies as the first period in you know Bob's uh, production history, because that's the the part that he that he really liked, because he felt that the the moment uh, Bob started using uh, language. Uh, those productions failed because Bob could, wasn't quite able to achieve with language what he had been able to achieve with images. Yeah, and, and, as, and in a certain way, so that, that second part of the book is kind of less interesting. I mean, also because that, you know, obviously they're very different. Uh, I mean, Ma Maria uh, Shevtsova, who we heard yesterday, for example, has a, you know, she provides a really excellent, more recent uh, interpretation, for example, on Einstein on the Beat, that completely contradicts uh, Stefan Brecht's uh, takedown uh, of, the, of that production. So, so it's, 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 it's more of a mixed bag, perhaps, than I kind of led on in my presentation. <laughs> we have time for one last question. Hi, Markus. <coughs> I remember some other things you I did in 88. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> um, <Giesner. laughs> I would really be interested to hear uh, you compare the estrangement effect used by Bob Wilson to the way that the uh, Rousseau group uses estrangement effects. If you could talk about that just a little bit, that would be great. Because they do. <laughs> oh, can, can you repeat again? I mean. Well, you talked about estrangement effects yeah. in Bob Wilson's work. And uh, at the same time as you know he did his work, the Wooster group kind of built their work very much on those same ideas. They used video, granted, but in the acting, in the acting, in the way that the performers performed. Yeah. How would you yeah. compare that since you're very familiar with the Wooster group work too? I would probably kind of describe uh, the use of estrangement effects in the Wooster group kind of differently from, from Bob, just because I feel that the, the, the Wooster Group productions, of course, that I'm familiar with, um, are far more about kind of technology and the use of different kind of, I don't know, media screens, so to speak. So, so a lot of estrangement in that context really also has to, has to do with how, how the, the live performance is kind of mediated. And that's, that's not quite how I would kind of see Bob's early, beca beca because the, uh, what, what both Brecht and, I mean, Bertel Brecht and, and, and Wilson are interested in er early on, I mean, uh, Bob early on, is, is, is the notion of kind of ordinariness. Yeah, so, so mm -hmm. Bob is very interested in, in, you know, ordinary life, ordinary people, you know, not, not people that are, that are kind of standing out. And, and to estrange that, ordinary aspect of life by, by introducing animal characters um, in, to, in, to, in, to insert this kind of, you know, ordinary life with almost kind of magical, mysterious, enigmatic kind of figures. That is far removed, I, I, I would say, from what the Wooster group uh, has been doing. 
<laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, and <laughs> oh. okay. our next panelists are Pierre Kleber and Larry Ng. Um, Dr. Pierre Kleber is professor in the Center for Drama, Theater, and Performance Studies at the BMO Lab for Creative Research in the Arts, Performance, and AI at the University of Toronto. She has published extensively on Bertolt Brecht, feminism, uh, Roger Planchon, Ariane Moschkin, George Ostrela, Robert Wilson, and Robert Lepage. And Larry Ng is a registered uh, drama therapist and a certified Feldenkrais method practitioner. His theater training includes both the Lecoq approach uh, to physical theater and De Cruz corporeal mime. He holds a BA and an MPhil in philosophy, an MA in drama education, and an MA in drama theater and performance uh, studies. And both this morning will uh, give a presentation on the dialectical triad of playwright, director, and Berliner ensemble actors in Wilson's Three Penny Opera. Bertolt Brecht and Robert Wilson are both theatrical giants who have transformed the mode of presentation and communication in the 20th century. Both recognized representation of theater as an artifact, but also as a sig the significance of the man, the actor, the live performer's activity. However, for Brecht and Wilson, the intended effect on the audience is quite different. Brecht targeted the underlying socio-political reality, whereas Wilson explored the pre-verbal reality of synesthesia. Thus, we can also argue that they develop different types of referendum and dialectics corresponding to the divergent mission, missions they assign to the theater. Wilson's 207 production of Brecht's The Three Penny Opera at the Schiffbauer Damm Theater of the Berlin Ensemble can be considered a special case among Wilson's work. He has much less freedom in editing and reorganizing the music and the text. And there is a linear narrative and a pre-existing structure to follow. In his later artistic stage, Wilson usually enjoys disintegrating, cutting and resequencing the text and in inserting other texts so that the classics are revisited under Wilson's aesthetic. He deconstructs the plays with language and, and opens up a space for pre-verbal reality and pre-cognitive mental activity in the spectator. In addition, in, the produ in this produ production, Wilson mainly works with actors from the Berliner Ensemble who are not only familiar with the classical interpretation of Brecht's play, but also trained in gestic acting. They were used to a rehearsal process where actors were co-created with the director and, this, and the designer, which seemed to be incompatible with Wilson's usual way of directing, having great control over the mise en scene. This became the second restraint Wilson encountered in this production. Therefore, an interesting question is, without his freedom to edit, do Wilson's unique aesthetics still work? How did he deal with such constraints? Do the aesthetics of Wilson's and Brecht clash with each other, or can they in some way dialectically co-create a unique third aesthetic? How can Wilson's directing and dominant aesthetic structure collaborate with the Brechtian actors' training? To demonstrate the complexity, um, dialectical complexity between Brecht and Wilson concretely, the paper first analyzed the scenography and the costume design in Wilson's production. These combined components create a Wilsonian visual space that is on the one hand different from the historical materialism and dialectical realism of Brecht, which makes historically specific details with an abstract space of theatrical artificiality. 
On the other hand, these sister arts support the Brechtian referendum and dialectical thinking in an even more effective way, especially in the contemporary context. In addition, we will examine the acting of two actors, Jürgen Hoss and Angeli Winkler, who acted with different styles, but both help the holistic aesthetics of Wilson's by enhancing the depth of Bragg's dialectical play. In this part, we shall also look into the rehearsal process to see how Wilson's collaborates with strong actors, their spontaneity and individualized inputs. Wilson's explain in the Berliner on, um, program, which he finds interesting about Bragg's theater is the space behind it. He says, behind this text, there is the finest irony. Behind the story, there is an idea. Behind the character, there's a story. Behind the space, there's tension. This is a great challenge to find this other side of the work, far beyond what is on paper. The production is introduced by the boisterous voice of Walter Schmiedinger announcing the content of the scene. Then, in true Wilsonian fashion, the characters parade in robot-like movements across the apron, backed by a black curtain with flashing squeals of light reminiscent of, circus, of a circus atmosphere. Wilson's okay. set design ignores Brecht's stage theory, which juxtaposes realistic theatrical signs, designing milieu and time, and linking stage space to non-theatrical reality. The model book of the 1928 Berliner production showed the use of a huge wooden door indicating the wedding scene's location as a typical stable. Instead, Robert Wilson sees the stage abstractly and begins every production with sketches and drawings. I quote, once I know the space, it is much easier for me to decide what to do in it, end of quote. Inspired by the American minimalist artist uh, Dan Davi, uh, Slavin, who created installations from commercially available fluorescent lights, light fixtures, Wilson described the Pichum shop in the following words, I quote, the Pichum shop is a scene of low screens with vertical and horizontal lines as if to suggest movable rugs of clothing. Together they make a low horizontal line across the space. And he says about the wedding scene, he sees it as a high barn like space as if light was coming through the boards of the barn. Sometimes parts of the back wall are <coughs> of lights disappear and change the depth of the space. By confronting two modes of representation, visual, the abstract neon lights, and verbal, Beckett's text, that complete and conflict each other, Wilson highlights the arbitrary and inadequate nature of all systems of representation, but adds another dimension to Brechtian critique. At one point in the wedding scene, when Mac and Tiger Brown sing the canon song, Polly is hanging high up like a religious icon and the, uh, among the vertical lines, giving the illusion of a church with Madonna. Religious associations are not new for Wilson. For the occasion of the Passion Play 2000 in Oberammergau, Germany, he was commissioned to create 14 spaces temporarily bound up with the staging of the Passion Play next door. At the 13th station of the strongest stylized tableau entitled Jesus is taken down from the cross and laid in Mary's arms, end of quote, the Mater Dolorosa was printed on a thin curtain with the face of the pop star Madonna as a modern relic. So, the dialectics of Wilson's abstraction, his lighting, the body of actor, and Bragg's text can be seen as a higher dialectical synthesis refueling religious aspects not written in the text. And regarding costume, Jacques Renou's design doesn't give any concrete statement about the dramatic characters. 
they're all black and white, except for McKeith and Polly, and they revealed strong silhouettes according to Wilson. On the one hand, the costumes are reminiscent of German silent films, expressionism, and the seductive world of Weimar area cabaret. On the other hand, they invoke some of the central themes of the current political climate, like gender issue, androgyny, and sexuality, far beyond what is on paper. Stefan Kurt as McKeith has a blonde, wavy, lacquer, dandy hairstyle, wears elbow length gloves, big painted eyes with false eyelashes, and fetish underwear beneath a shimmering, sequined black suit, a kind of corset that emphasizes the missing breasts. Later, when he briefly puts on his friend Tiger Brown's top hat, the association with Marley Dietrich is obvious. Once back in jail, after having shown up at the whorehouse, he is dressed like a Wall Street banker. Jürgen Holz as Pitum looks like a clown or mime, reminding the audience of the circus-like atmosphere of the prologue. So from the few details mentioned above, we can see that Wilson's visuals perform a threefold functions in their interaction with Brecht text. First, echoing via visual suggestions what the scenes require according to the text. Second, adding new associations, including both socio-political and non-political ones, to the socio-political themes and topic in the texts, especially in relation to the contemporary context where the socio-historical condition and social concerns have changed. Third, injecting rich visual aesthetics of expressionism, symbolism, surrealism, and abstractionism to Bragg's dialectical sociological text, exposing the contradiction and the limitations while at the same time letting them enrich each other, allowing the audience to make their own associations. Besides interacting with Bragg's text, Wilson's visuals also form a self-sufficient aesthetic space through his signature elements, like his use of light and contrast, his huge horizontal proscenium stage, and a spatial configuration that compresses a 3D theater stage into a 2D canvas. The actors and settings becoming part of a larger painting that is evolving, as can be clearly seen in the prologue and many other moments. Also, his use of sound effect and the time prolongating moments of silence creates intentional interruptions to the original flow of the text. This allows Wilson's own aesthetics to temporarily dominate and make Bragg's narrative subordinate to Wilson's aesthetics cosmos. All this creates a possibility of reading Bragg under Wilson, which can be non-political but purely poetic and dreamy different from a reading in which Wilson's mise-en-scene serve and enrich Brecht. The possibility of opposing readings provide ch chances of mutual referendum between Brecht's dramaturgy and Wilson's mise-en-scene, actualizing the dialectics among sister arts that Brecht envisioned. Now let's turn to the acting to see how the dialectics between Wilson and Brecht works to create a dialectical relationship between Wilson and strong actors. In Brecht's Three Penny, Wilson offers his usual extravagant, often grotesque visual aesthetics, like the well choreographed ballet of Max Bendit in the wedding scene. But there, is all, there, but there are also many Brechtian moments. Jürgen Holz as Pichum worked throughout his career with many former Brecht students like Benno Besson and Heiner Müller. He can't help himself translating vague, stylized Wilson gestures into a Brechtian gestus. His pronunciation of words is crystal clear, but his body posture often contradicts the text. When du verrotteter Christ, mach dich an dein sündiges Leben. Zeig, was für ein Schurke du bist. 
when Filch pays his due, his due, Petrum's body mimes the dropping of the coin into his hand and pocket, accompanied by a prolonged and exaggerated clanking of the silver as if falling into a metal can. Petrum's faces change from a grim expression into a laughing grimace. <laughs> Christina Drexler as the wide-eyed, fluttery and doll-like Polly transforms her girlish behavior when singing the pirate Jenny song. Suddenly, one can recognize the cold, tough daughter of Petrum behind the childish facade equipped to take over both businesses, her father's and Max. The wedding is like a business transaction. Mit acht und mit 50 Kanonen wird liegen am Kai. Man sagt, geh, wisch deine Gläser, mein Kind. Und man reicht mir den Penny hin. Der Penny wird genommen und das Bett wird gemacht. Es wird keiner mehr drin schlafen in dieser Nacht. Und sie wissen immer noch nicht, wer ich bin. Und sie wissen immer noch nicht, wer ich bin. Max, Max drags his bride along the floor and to the stage like a sack of potatoes. The two hardly ever look at each other, and when they do kiss, they are rather like two women, which also questions Polly's sexual orientation. Their body postures dispel any notion of sexual tension or lust between them. They both radiate loneliness and cold calculation. On the other hand, there is clearly a, stro a strong erotic relationship between Max and uh, Mac and Tiger Brown, while Mac tells the audience how the chief of the London police was covering up all his crimes. A very special place in Wilson's production and lauded by most of the critics was Angela Winkler as Mac's ex-lover and whore Jenny. Winkler does not give a damn about the acting jargon like Verfremdung. She is a great actor who always finds the right way to bring out the meaning of the text. In a conversation, she related that Wilson never imposed any gestures on her. He just tells her story and allows her to find her own body postures and voice. She says, I quote, Bob needs strong personalities, not small actors who just want to imitate him. Winkler's Salomon song is like a unique mini mise en scène devoid of any verfremdung, singing in a brilliant vibrato how she is torn apart by love for and hatred of McKee. This almost delirious scene by Angela Winkler is like an accident in Wilson's theater. He, Wilson, is not interested in the soul of the characters, neither was Chris. But precisely because Wilson keeps the characters in the three pennies so distant, Angela's realistic and emotional rendering provides such a powerful contrast. Hallo, Moon. Ihr wisst, was aus ihm wird. Die Mann war alles sonnenklar. Ihr verfluchte die Stunde seiner Geburt und sah, dass alles eitel war. So groß und weiß. 
So, to sum up, another quote of Wilson's can be helpful. Besides digging into the space behind Brecht's text by letting Lear, Wilson said the following during rehearsals. I don't have to make theaters with Lear. Shakespeare already make the theater. What I have to find is a way to put this theater on a stage with enough room around those words so that people can hear them and think about them. I don't believe in talking back to the masterpiece. I let this talk to me. The same applies also to Brecht's. Meanwhile, Wilson, the painter and visual artist, also took moments to interrupt the text in the free ten opera to show his painterly visions in which the architecture he built on stage, the actor and Brecht's text all turn into images that are part of his painting. Both Wilson's architectural and painterly design interact with Brecht's text, supporting and renewing the latter with visual audio suggestions, as well as rich Im imaginary possibilities of association and creative ambiguity. Moreover, Wilson's openness in his utilizations of actors with strong and but different qualities and strengths during rehearsals also add another layer, layer of dialectics to the text. This result, the result is a synthesis of Wilsonian, Brechtian, and naturalistic psychological acting. This enriches both Wilson's and Brecht's modes of acting and opens even more space in the play. The Free Penny Opera was a special opportunity for such dialectical synthesis to happen, not just because Wilson's encounter constraint that he seldom has, but also because Brecht's text is special in its episodic structure, its equal emphasis on realism and artifacts, and its inherent dialectical dramaturgy. This case demonstrates an important example of how the non-political and the political can be combined. It opens up a possibility of dual reading and a space with ample freedom of association. This ensures a space to prevent a socio-political text from turning into propaganda and shows us the importance of the non-political in the political. Wilson's visual audio cosmos is in itself non-political, but it has also a threefold political significance. First, each audience member has freedom in making their association and interpretation. Second, there's a space of creative ambiguity and contained chaos for ordinary order to dissolve or to be deconstructed and for new order to come into formation. Third, there is a space for the non-political to exist, which is important to avoid everything being subordinated to the political interpretation as the only single possibility. Conversely, the political dimension of Brecht's play also enriches Ilsen's non-political -co cosmos because Ilsen is the political is not necessarily the only or the most important human quality it is still an important and inevitable dimension of human existence and can be reflected upon within the Wilsonian universe. Contemplating through Wilson's lens, cruelty and isolation among people is, is not only political but metaphysical. Thank you. So I think, I think we have time for two questions. Um, uh, could you go into a bit more about uh, uh, Wilson's use of the uh, music in this production? Well, in the production, of course, he could not change the music. The only thing he could do to interrupt the music, which he has done frequently. But it was the only thing. It was also, I mean, the text, he couldn't change the text. He could shorten the text, but not change it. And he couldn't insert anything. So the only thing for music and also for the text is just to interrupt. One final question, perhaps? What struck me in your talk and in Marcus's talk beforehand um, was a comment that you made yesterday 
Marcus, about um, the, about the queer Wilson, and I feel like in both of these talks that was very evident. Um, if you could talk about w uh, what you see in that I uh, in this production in particular, in in just your queering of 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 the play, do you see is that something that you see in that production? Can you? I think the one thing. Can you repeat the question? I think that the queering, you know, we oh just the queer. talked the about queer, okay. queer aesthetics. Queering is yeah. It yeah, first of all, I mean, it's it's very clear that that uh, McKeith is a transvestite, you know, who comes, and then you really see um, between the characters, first of all, that there is just action without any kind of emotional detachment. They really, and and specifically the the love scene for them. It's a stage scene, it's like a transaction because of business, but there is just no tension whatsoever. And you can also see this into, into um, very clearly in the costumes. And besides the uh, blurring of the boundary of the gender or sexuality, there's also a lot of blurring of the boundary between good and evil, transgression and then love, and a lot of opposition is blurred. So I would see in this direction also. I think we have to uh, conclude okay. at this point, but thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
Here, however, lies one significant difference between the two men. There is some irony in the fact that Artaud, who wanted to downgrade verbal communication on stage and replace it with direct visual language, has actually exerted his wide influence on theater, mainly through the written words of his theoretical texts, while his practical work is usually dismissed. Wilson, by comparison, never put his artistic views down in writing, let alone formulated any comprehensive theory of performance. And his evolving vision is manifested in the many performances he created. In the absence of any interpretative key or theory of performance, Wilson's viewers and critics have to approach his work directly without mediation of language and evaluate it first and foremost as a formal visual oral construction in time and space. However, while Artaud never realized his ideal theater, the few practical experiments he conducted still serve as significant clues to the kind of theater he wished to create. And they also point to a gulf between his theory, as it is usually perceived, and his practice. As Christopher Innes showed in his avant-garde theater, Artaud's attempt to find practical form for his theory resulted in a surprisingly cool, calculated and formalized performance which had little in common with cruelty or violence as they're usually perceived. I will therefore also pay particular attention in my talk to the only full length play staged by Artaud, the Chenchi, which seems to lead directly to Wilson's ritualistic formal dream visions, and most particularly to his early work from the late 1960s and 1970s. So Wilson's silent operas, which we heard a bit about already today, a series of spectacles produced from 1968 to 1973, including Death Man Glance, seen in this image, fulfilled Artaud's prescription of a presentation of myth in the form of ceremony, resulting in a theater of magic, which induced the state of trance in performers and viewers alike. The operas displayed many of the characteristic features of ritualistic form as defined by Roy Rappaport. These include the stylization of performance, the extreme slow motion, which created a sense of otherworldliness and magic, and the careful repetition of actions executed in extreme concentration. Stefan Precht, we also heard about him earlier today, who performed in some of the silent operas, describes how performers felt to be in the nature of a humorous religious activities, with participants approaching them with the intense radiation of a magical rite. Performers reported experiencing liminal states of consciousness during performance. Cheryl Sutton, for example, describes entering a near trance state while sitting completely immobile for over an hour. And Andy de Croix similarly relates how spinning rapidly on stage for long periods of time concerns the mind state between waking and sleeping, life and a dream, the conscious and the unconscious. Artaud, like Wilson after him, focused the, on the poetic visual image, which was to become the center of his new theater of myth and magic, where language was demoted to a secondary place. Dreams became the model for Arthur's poetic visual image. The public will believe in the theater's dreams to condition, uh, sorry, in the theater's dreams on condition that it takes them for true dream and not for the servile copy of reality on condition that they allow the public to liberate within itself the magical liberties of dreams. Wilson's theater, famously described by Louis Aragon as an extraordinary freedom machine, would present non-mimetic dream worlds in Aragon's, world, it, in, in Aragon's words, sorry, it is at the same time waking life and life with your eyes closed. Wilson's visually striking images which stunned the audience's senses by their sheer power are a realization of Arthur's concrete sign or hieroglyphs, which were to influence spectators directly without the mediation of rational means. A theater in which violent physical images crush and hypnotize the sensibility of the spectator seized by the theater as by a whirlwind of higher forces. Wilson believed that his images, which circumvent language and rationality, would communicate directly with the viewer's interior screen, a term conceived by him as a mental space free of social and cultural predeterminates, where events are registered subjectively, and each individual's imagination assigns them personal meaning. Much of this communication was to be achieved by the performer. As Lawrence Shire observed, 
Each action on Wilson's stage became a vessel capable of containing a person's energy or inner personality and a small piece of human truth. Wilson appears to refer to the result as a kind of Autodian direct communication between the performer and the audience. Ideally, in our work, someone in the audience might reach a point of consciousness where he is on the same frequency as one of the performers, where he receives communication directly. Artaud expressed similar ideas decades earlier, claiming, for example, that images of energy in the stage presentation are assumed to evoke a mirror state in the spectator's mind. Artaud's attempts to find physical and visual means of affecting the audience directly without the mediation of language was also reincarnated in the near elimination of language in Wilson's early work, which established a direct communication with the audience by means of physical and concrete sounds and images, music and dance. Perceiving of language in speech as expressing daily reality, Arto advocated for a non-literary theater. This theater would, all, would use language as incantation, emphasizing one's ability to create music in their own right. Correspondingly, language in his staging of the Chenchi was treated sonorically with a dialogue which was neither conversational nor conventionally dramatic, but orchestrated and formulated for musical rhythmic effect. When language was incorporated into Wilson's theater as a more significant element, beginning with a letter for Queen Victoria in 1974, it was done very similarly to Arto, with words and sounds repeated and formally structured for visual or musical effect. This again harks back to Arto, who in the banquet scene of the Chenchi, for example, created repeated vocal patterns, which were superimposed on the dialogue, composing, for example, a cry, followed by a laugh, then a sob. Such a musical kinetic tapestry in which the rhythms and movements and sounds are both highly calculated and coordinated, and spatial and audio repetitions prevail, again reminds one of Wilson's meticulously planned audiovisual collages with their insistent ritualistic repetitions. And one can think of productions such as Hamlet Machine, which I assume many of you know, as a good example of that. Wilson often thinks of the text of his works in formal structural terms, describing the text of his Death, Destruction and Detroit, for example, as an architectural arrangement of musical verbal elements. One of the more surprising affinities between the two men lies in their formal, planned and calculated approach to performance and the performer. Artaud famously believed that poetic images were to create this liberation um, via cruelty, which, as he repeatedly explains, does not necessarily mean sadism or bloodshed. In fact, the inspiration for his attempts to formulate his perceptions of this non-literary theater of cruelty, the Balinese Dad's Company, which he famously encountered at the Paris Colonial Exposition in 1931, was characterized by the exact opposite of what is usually associated with Artorian cruelty. Despite Artaud's many misunderstandings of the performance and its context, his interpretation of it and his foregrounding of its formal element are significant for understanding his vision. He praised the Balinese theater's direct visual language, and much of his praise can be applied to Wilson's performances, such as Einstein on the Beach, with very few alterations. Artaud believed that the Balinese performance's spiritual architecture was meticulously calculated precise, mechanized, and mathematical. That it was a theater of ceremony where everything was predetermined and nothing spontaneously improvised, intended to communicate with the viewers unconscious. Arto emphasizes the minute gesture, the systematic def depersonalization, and the musical qualities of physical movement. In Arto's own theatrical experiments, the moves, gestures, and intonations were similarly carefully noted and rehearsed so that nothing about the final performance was accidental. Actors who worked with him described a process of wide artistic search during rehearsals, but the result was a fixed performance. Documents related to his performances, such as Roger Blanc's production notes in the prompt book of the Chenchi, stressed disciplined precision and strictly organized performance. 
considering this, it is probably not surprising that the shocking and brutal occurrences of the Chenchi, including crimes of incest and parricide, uh, received formal treatment, which focused on the language of gesture and signs and resulted in a surprisingly cool, formal and precise staging. As Innes discerned, there was little sense of violence or cruelty in the scenic rhythms that are so defined as the most important aspect of his performance. Attempting to communicate directly with the audience and achieve a dream state and a ritualistic experience via disciplined precision and strict organization, Arto used in the Chenchi and other plays techniques which hinder causality and representation. These include perspectival distortions or slow motion which, with characters moving extraordinarily slowly or walking at a stage-like pace, something which Wilson, of course, would later perfect. The prompt book for the Chenchi contains more notes on patterning and tempo than any other aspect, and the acting style of the production was highly formalized. Actors were required to move in organized formal patterns, either in progression, opposition, or unison, forming calculated symmetry. Mass movements were based on simple geometric forms such as parallels, circles, or triangles. In a scene depicting the orgiastic banquet, to which I already referred, guests danced in three circles of carefully growing sizes and accelerating speeds with the slower one inside and the faster outside. According to Alto, in this scene, he aimed at the dehumanized mechanization, which he compared to the workings of a clock the opposite of what one would normally expect from a scene of orgy. Artaud further refers to his production in terms not unlike his depiction of the Balinese theater, emphasizing the precision and strictness of the movements and the mathematical entr entrances and exits of actors moving around one another in a way which created a spatial geometry on stage, ruled by what Artaud called an inhuman rhythm. This, once again, exposes the similarity to Wilson's geometric rhythmic work with performers in productions such as Einstein on the Beach with the stylized artificial acting and actions executed with the exactitude of ceremony. Anyone who has ever seen Wilson, a Wilson rehearsal is very familiar with the insistence on the same parameters which occupied Artaud, tempo and exactitude of movement. As a result, Wilson's performers have often been compared to puppets, moving automata, joystick sculptures, or simply vectors moving in space. With their emphasis on movement and tempo, their accurate geometric movement patterns, and with their actions broken down into mathematical sequences, Artaud's images show striking similarity to Wilson's work with the performer. The introduction of music as a significant element into Wilson's theater with Einstein on the Beach in 1976 further exposes his work's affinities to Arthur. In this production, Wilson's hypnotic images were complemented by Philip Glass's trance-induced sequel repetitive rhythms based on the structure of the Indian Kala, creating a, a synergic effect as image and music combined to induce a hypnotic state in the spectators. Not surprisingly, critics spoke of the production's ritualistic pictures, eerie otherworldly quality, and the hypnotic quality of the music and stage, which they declared was almost religiously moving. The music for the Chenchi, composed by Roger um, de Sauvier, uh, similarly includes sounds organized into repetitive cyclical rhythmic patterns based on Inca musical structures this time, instead of melody which created a hypnotic effect on the audiences. Again, not unlike that induced by the repetitive rhythmic cycles of Balinese gamelan music, which Arto heard when he saw the performance. The affinities also extend to the use of sound. Arto advocated for a total spectacle where visual and sonorous outbursts are separated, are spread, sorry, over the entire mass of spectators, completely immersing the audience into the performance. The Chenchi utilizes new sound technologies, and the audience was surrounded with sound by projecting and amplifying such things as performers' voices and footsteps via loudspeakers surrounding the auditorium in an attempt to affect audiences on a physiological level. The result was a total soundscape, which anticipated the total sound environments created by Hans Peter Kuhn 
and his work with Wilson on productions such as that disruption in Detroit in 1979, when the sound was dispersed in space through several loudspeakers located in and around the auditorium. So to conclude, the different aspects briefly delineated here do not exhaust the totality of the affinities between Wilson and Artaud, but they point to the existence of some significant parallels between their work. This in turn also helped to better contextualize Wilson's work within the landscape of American and world theater and performance by exposing some affinities between his work and the very different aesthetics of other directors and groups active at the same time, thus shedding new light both on Wilson, Artaud, and perhaps also the work of other theater creators. Thank you. Okay, we have time for, 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 for your questions. Hi, thank you so much for that paper. Um, I'm following in a similar path with some of my scholarship. And one of the things that I'm thinking about is that our toe scenographically for the theater itself besides sound, wanted to create a total theater so that the proscenium wasn't there. But the proscenium is so important for Wilson. So I'm wondering how you're thinking about those two uh, possibilities. Or yeah. yeah, I think um, that's an interesting question that I've also occupied myself with. And I, I can actually say a lot about that, so I'll try to be very brief. Um, I think that I see the similarities between Arto and Wilson, mainly in Wilson's use of sound, which I believe is sort of like intended to overcome the separation of auditorium and uh, stage, which is so typical of his performances. And he also worked outside the theater stage in some areas where he could create a kind of like a total spectacle or immersive environment. Um, for example, like in his Venice Biennale performance, which was different. So I think that in, in, in some ways, it's true that his theater productions do stress this separation, but I think it's, there are other works in which he does try to create this kind of thinking. And I think that his theater very much comes from the same perception of uh, total performance, even though he chose to work within the proscenium space. Thank you again. Um, when you spoke about puppets, I just couldn't help but think about Gordon Craig's Uber Marionette mm -hmm. and that sort of idea of total control. And I'm wondering if you could talk about the way you see Wilson or Arto being influenced by Gordon Craig's design and theories. Oh, so I think that, well, there have been numerous critical references to the um, Wilson being kind of like a modern incarnation of this idea of, of uh, um, Craig and, and as well as other uh, formalists. And it, uh, in Wilson's case, I would say that it's pretty obvious that he wasn't, from what he says and other contemporaries say, he was not aware of all these theatrical developments. He sort of evolved his style in a way which corresponds with these things, although he, again, was not aware of that. Artaud was aware of that, and he was part of the same chain of, of involvement of uh, perception of um, the artist as somebody who, um, could become a formal element. And actually, he was also very much influenced by the Bauhaus and other movements, which also dealt with similar experiments. So you're very right. I also see this kind of like a movement of like a formal work with the artist. But Wilson is actually one point in the chain. But the curious thing about Wilson is that unlike many other people, he was not aware of the fact that he was part of this chain. But he just created his works this way, which I find fascinating. OK, are there more questions? Um, I was struck with the Cheryl Sutton image and comment about her entering a trance state, yeah. sitting there for an hour, um, and kind of going back to Maria Shostova's comments about the spirit. And she was talking about it more in terms of the relationship of Wilson's work towards the audience. I was wondering if you have any insights about um, about the role of the the spirit or this entering of into other states uh, in relationship to the performers. Because also with Artaud, like the watching the Balinese. Mm -hmm. performers if there's a level of in of ritual and also of that ritual inducing something within the performers 
Yeah, so again, I have a lot to say, but I'll try to say something which makes sense in a short time. So I think that in many ways there is some sort of a misunderstanding of works of theater when people often say that his theater doesn't communicate with the audience. And I believe that it does communicate with the audience, only it does so very differently than other forms of theater that we're used to. So if you look at Cheryl Sutton, and she describes how she really, and many times, many of his performances, especially in the early works, really did enter a trance-like state. And Wilson himself, you can see that in many of his early references, and, and this was actually corroborated by the experience of the performance, that they felt that when they entered a kind of a state of trance or some sort of an inner concentration, that this was actually echoed by the audience and that there was some kind of like an energetic um, mirroring happening the, sa the same way that Arthur would relate to that, that this actually happens. And I think it's very interesting that many um, theater performers uh, and many theories of theater actually um, think of this kind of similarity as a given within different forms. If you think of Stanislavski, then you know, if I identify with my character, then you will identify with me. If you think of Brecht, if I sort of create a split between me and the character, you will, and the audience will perceive the split. So in Wilson, it's kind of the same thing, only in different forms. So if I enter this kind of like a trance state, and I, um, am, as an actor, am hypnotized on stage, this experience will be echoed by the audience. And there's actually evidence that in some cases it worked for audience members, in others it didn't. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And our next presenter is uh, Dan Wenning, who is an associate professor in the Department of Theater and Dance at Union College in uh, Schenectady, New York. His articles and reviews have appeared in numerous journals and edited collections. Uh, he also holds a PhD in theater from the CUNY Graduate Center. <laughs> and today he will talk about transformation through repetition, Robert Wilson's aesthetics, and Einstein on the beach in 2012. Yeah, go ahead. Um, will this show up on here? I put it in the HDMI. Huzzah. Okay. Um, thank you so much. I'm so honored to be speaking here in this session alongside such experts on Wilson, Brecht, Narto. I'm much more of a visitor into this area of avant-garde theater and dramaturgy, and so I'm really honored to be a part of this conference at my old graduate program. Um, in September 2012, Philip Glass and Robert Wilson's Einstein on the Beach was revived at BAM as part of a year-long assortment of events worldwide celebrating Glass's 75th birthday. A year earlier, Wilson's staging of Brecht's Three Penny Opera for the Berliner Ensemble, originally created in 2007, had been featured on the same stage. In my presentation for this symposium, I utilized my experiences as an audience member at Einstein on the Beach, which I reviewed for the CUNY Graduate Center Advocate while a graduate student here. Some of this paper comes from that review. Um, to argue that Wilson's aesthetics often center around the premise that rep repetition does not preclude change. Rehearsal and repetition, which last night Wilson called theme and variation, can lead to radical transformation. My argument is based on my experience as an audience member, so I'm going to spend a good portion of this paper describing what I saw. And that allows me to delve, at least briefly, into Wilson's disparate influences from Artaud's Theater of Cruelty. Um, in Spurt of Blood, Artaud describes one stage action as taking place with desperate slowness, nauseating slowness, a phrase that I'd say certainly applies to most of Einstein on the beach. Uh, German devised Regier Theater and the dreamlike slowness of nose plays, Japanese no plays. In examining this work, we see how Wilson's dramaturgy as director and designer of Einstein aligned with his collaboration with composer Philip Glass and choreographer Lucinda Child, both of whom also drew upon the aesthetics of radical transformation in their creation of the work. First, a summary of what I saw in 2012, since Einstein on the Beach resists easy summarization. The opera runs four and a half hours long without intermission, although the audience was free to get up and use the restroom, or as I noticed at the time, leave. Not everyone made it through the long work. 
The show has little by way of plot. Its libretto is less than 10 pages long. Um, the text by Christopher Knowles, Lucinda Childs, and Samuel L. Johnson primarily consists of nonsense, repeated phrases, open-ended references to a wide variety of figures. Mr. Bojangles figures prominently, but the Beatles and Carol King make appearances. There's also a lot of numbers and simple descriptions. The opera begins with knee play, in which two characters, Helga Davis and Kate Morin in the 2012 production, sat on chairs in a box of light downstage right, speaking, Philip, speaking text as Philip Glass's chorus sang numbers. These characters, like almost everyone in the opera, wore high-waisted gray slacks, suspenders, a white button-up shirt, and lace-up sneakers. Echoing Wilson's staging of Brecht's Three Penny Opera for Brecht's own Berliner Ensemble, which was staged at BAM a year earlier in 2011, most of the characters were costumed in black and white, creating at times the sense of an old-timey silent film, despite the fact that, of course, this opera foregrounds music and sound. At the end of the first knee play, an image of a young boy, clearly Einstein as a child, appeared against the background of a painted beach scene. There are five such knee plays spaced throughout the show. In the first four, Davis and Morin remained confined to the box of light at the downstage right corner, and each of those four ended with a different image of Einstein projected onto the light. Following the first knee play is train one. Downstage right with his back to the audience, a man in a red shirt mimed doing calculations with a large piece of chalk. As he did this, a dancer repeated a diagonal dance across the stage while a boy stood on a towering scaffolding, playing with a glass cube and occasionally throwing paper airplanes down onto the set. A conch shell sat downstage right in a pool of light, and three times a two-dimensional train came out on stage from the stage left wings. After it emerged the third time, a pillar of light was projected vertically along the back, back wall extending from the train smokestack. This scene is followed by trial one, in which two judges, one old and one young, preside over a courtroom from a bench littered with scientific paraphernalia such as beakers and textbooks. A lawyer spoke text about Mr. Bojangles, while a violin soloist, costumed in makeup and a wig to look like Einstein, played downstage right. This is followed by the second knee play, then field, a dance, um, a dance on a bare stage lit with shifting pastel lights in the background. Following this is Night Train, apologies, uh, I wasn't provided images from these uh, by BAM, in which a courtship was apparently enacted in the back of a train between an interracial couple in Edwardian attire. Yet as their vocal duet ended and they entered the train, she pulled a gun on him and turned towards the audience, grinning. This was followed by the third knee play, a second trial scene that transitioned into a prison sequence, a second field dance, and a fourth knee play. The next scene is building, in which a woman mimed calculating in the upper stories of a tower, vaguely reminiscent of several blocky towers at Princeton University, although more modern than, the Gothic, than their Gothic revival, and also Einstein was a faculty member at the independent um, Institute for Advanced Studies, which is in Princeton, New Jersey, but not associated with Princeton University. Yeah, for those of you who aren't that concerned about all that stuff, I'll just mention oh. Einstein and Princeton um, at the Harlem Tunnel. Yeah, I, I know that building. It's reminiscent of the Princeton. That's, that's what I was seeing when I saw it, though. So yeah, I was seeing those blocky towers at Princeton that I know well. But thank you for, for highlighting what that building actually is. I didn't recognize that. Um, Thank you, that's helpful. Um, and then the company uh, uh, assembled below and formed a tableau. Following this is bed, um, in which a soloist vocalized while, the violin, while a violinist played, and almost imperceptibly slowly, a long strip of white light moved from horizontal at the bottom of the stage to vertical, and then moved up into the fly space, out of view. The next scene is spaceship. Uh, showing the inside of a brightly lit, futuristic, mechanical, as I saw it, nightmare. Tight glass elevators with performers trapped within flew horizontally and vertically in the air, and a small toy missile uh, rose diagonally across the stage. Suddenly, a scrim descended, and onto it was projected a, dis 
description of the effects of a nuclear explosion. The scrim rose and two glass globes downstage right filled with gas as the chorus rose to a chaotic cacophony. The final scene is another knee play, except this time the characters were on a bench stage right, a two-dimensional cutout of a bus appeared from the stage left wings, and the bus driver recites the final speech, a moving ode to the immeasurable power of love. Now to me, this apparently senseless action of Einstein on the beach, uh, complemented by music and movement that employed similarly challenging aesthetics, Glass's music, while melodic, is cyclical and repetitive, much like the text, and singing often consists simply of numbers or vocalizations on vowel sounds. Child's dances are similarly repetitive, often requiring the dancers to repeat the same motions again and again and again and again and again. Such repetitions must be exhausting, but the performers throughout most of the show cultivate that disaffected air that matches the blandness of their costumes and white fake face makeup that many of them wear. In addition to this repetition, much of the action proceeds at a pace that was, as I said, unbearably slow. It was actually really fun to sit through four and a half hours of this and to subject myself to that unbearableness. There was some sort of it felt like activity. Um, <laughs> but these challenging aesthetics don't mean that the show is meaningless. We heard last night about how Wilson resists single meanings for his work, letting the audience take from that what they will. So it's, for me, it's thematically centered around Einstein, and the repetition is a crucial part of this theme. For Einstein, nuclear physics was the direct result of the study of Newtonian physics, but a radical transformation. Um, the spaceship and nuclear weapons of the end of the opera are thus related to the study of the train at the beginning. They're both the result of the same scientific inquiry represented by the man in the red shirt doing calculations, but Einsteinian relativity requires a radical transformation of understanding. Time is no longer the constant. The show also suggests that the unique mind filled with inquiry can show up anywhere. The man in the red shirt is later seen as a member of the jury, the lone member wearing red among a chorus of greys. Here we see how in this courtroom, which is simultaneously a science classroom, there can be dissent shaking up established consensus. Einstein on the beach doesn't shy away from the darker implications of Einstein's discoveries. They lead both to the advancement of human understanding and also the terrible destruction of the atomic bomb. In the opera, Wilson and Glass acknowledge that forward motion isn't always good. But the final knee play in which the two characters are freed from the box in which they've been confined in the earlier scenes and the bus driver speaks movingly about love suggests that change is also what brings about the sublime forces of hope, love, and imagination. So here's where I get to repetition with revisions. In theater, the term repetition and revision is perhaps most associated with the playwright Susan Laurie Parks, who places this aesthetic at the core of her work, calling it rep and rev. She highlights jazz aesthetics as the basis for her own artistic practice, noting that, quote, the composer or performer will write or play a musical phrase once and again and again, etc. But she could also have gotten this from the avant-garde theater of the 60s, 70s, and 80s, nearly half a century ago, of which Wilson was a pioneer. The production that I saw in 2012 was, like the aesthetics within it, a sort of repetition of an earlier work with revisions. Einstein on the Beach was created in 1976, that's when that Maplethorpe photo is from, first staged at Avignon and then the Met later that year, and revived at BAM in 1984, the McCarter in 92, and BAM in 2012 when I saw it. These revivals all toured globally, globally and were all overseen by Wilson, Glass, and Childs. My experience seeing the production was certainly different from those of many of my fellow audience members very familiar with Wilson and Glass, returning to BAM to see a work they had seen before in that same space nearly 30 years earlier. I was a graduate student in theater here, excited to see a seminal work that had been written before I was born, 
I was barely two years old when the first BAM revival opened in December 1984. My first experience of Philip Glass was actually parody. In my first year of high school, where I got the acting bug that eventually led to a career in academic theater, I acted in David Ives' All in the Timing, a set of comic scenes. One of these is the absurdist, Philip Glass buys a loaf of bread, in which rhythm, sound, repetition, and music convey the depth of emotion in a mundane moment. Philip Glass running into a former lover while buying bread at a bakery. The reason that I bring myself and my age and inexperience with the works of Glass and Wilson when I attended in 2012 into this paper is because of what Marvin Carlson, my doctoral advisor here at CUNY, termed ghosting. In The Haunted Stage, the theater is memory machine, Carlson argues that theater is essentially a memory machine, forcing audiences to review everything that they receive. It is an art form in which the idea of looking again is inscribed in the re of reception. Carlson calls this process of intertextual embodied recycling ghosting. For Carlson, reception is conditioned by various types of ghosting, whether textual through a memory of reading or knowing the text, bodily through knowing an actor you've seen before on stage, spatial through knowing the theater building, having gone to that same space at BAM again and again, the year before to see Three Penny or many years earlier to see Einstein there, or theatrical through having seen previous productions, the original production, earlier revivals, a different production of the same play or musical. A revival such as the 2012 production of Einstein on the Beach for Carlson is thus also a revivification or a seance, bringing up the ghosts of the past onto the stage of the present. It's perhaps no surprise that what Carlson describes is essentially the plot of every Japanese no play in which the walkie takes a journey, is told a story, and then encounters the shite, the embodied central character in that story, frequently a ghost. The story is never new. It's one that the central character, the walkie, like the audience knows and is told before they encounter. No plays are, like Wilson's theater, intentionally languidly dreamlike. The walkie moves in a circle around the stage to represent his journey. The story of the shite is told again and again and again. Yet at the end of this genre's encounter between the phenomenological world of the walkie and the phantasmal world of the shite, there is change. Lady Aoi is freed from the vengeful spirit of Rokujo. The spirits of the sisters Matsukaze and Murasame, through their encounter with the walkie, move past the mortal longing that led to their death. Atsumori forgives his killer, who has become a priest. No aesthetics are called Joha Kyu, moving from a nearly static beginning to a period in which the mold is broken and then a rapid transformative ending. No is intentionally dreamlike, and it's not unusual for audience members to fall asleep at a no play, moving from the dream play into actual dreams. While the languorous aesthetics of No and Wilson's theater permeate the staging, permeate some stagings of Artaud's work, the spurt of blood is only four pages, making Einstein on the beach look like a long text, Artaud would likely have been opposed to the idea of revivals such as the one that I saw in 2012, although he certainly was uh, working with a previously written text in the Chenchi, which we just heard about. But in No More Masterpieces, a key essay in his The Theater and Its Double, Artaud argues almost exactly the opposite of Carlson, that for theater to be effective, it must be entirely new. No more Shakespeare, no more Moliere. The audience must be given something it has never seen before. For Artaud, this is part of the cruelty in that it's shocking, forcing audiences to experientially encounter something that they haven't before. In 1976, this is famously what Wilson and Glass did with their four and a half hour long modernist opera. Last night, we heard Wilson echo Artaud when he lamented how literature and theater have been tied together. When he quoted Susan Sontag on experience as a way of thinking, he said that the experience, the surface, is key for him. It doesn't have to have a meaning. 
We also heard Wilson echo Brecht's um, condemnations of naturalism, calling for presentational theater where we watch someone we know is acting, not watch someone try to sit exactly like they do in real life. But while this was new, while Wilson's theater, not Brecht and Artaud, was new to me in 2012, the same cannot be said for many of the audience members, or for Wilson, Glass, and Childs themselves, once again overseeing a work they had created nearly four decades earlier and revived multiple times before. Although it was a revival in the same theater where it had been seen in 1984, so much had transformed, not least of all the creators, no longer the enfant terrible photographed by Robert Maplethorpe, but now the elder statesman of the theater and the music world. And as I'm approaching 20 minutes, I'd like to close with the idea of legacy. That is in the title of this conference. I did that pretty well with that timer over there. Yeah. Um, uh, a legacy is what we leave behind, but Robert Wilson, as we saw last night, is still very much alive, going off to Germany in a week and a half to create work. I mean, I hope I'm doing that when I'm 82, just saying. Um, we heard him in conversation with Frank Henschker yesterday evening, and he'll be leading us on a tour of Watermill on Thursday. But while we're alive, we can think about and try to shape the legacies we hope to leave for future generations, whether future scholars, artists, students, or our family and friends. It's obvious from the papers in this conference and the degree to which Robert Wilson, uh, and from what we've seen, the degree to which Robert Wilson has created a vibrant legacy for the theater. In some respects, that legacy has been inevitable since his earliest works. The New York Times called the 1976 original Einstein on the Beach path-breaking. But in the 2012 revival of Einstein, we can see, and I saw then, how he worked and still works to shape and share his legacy for new generations of audiences who know more about the shape of the building than I, what the building is than I do, so thank you. Um, a revival isn't just a repetition, it's a transformation through repetition. Thank you. Okay, we have time for a few questions. I was talking what you ended with kind of the idea of revival and the creation or the crafting of one's own legacy because I don't know your name but last night you asked about will we ever see the civil wars and it seemed like um, Wilson was saying no that's from a specific time and we don't revive things and yet this is a piece that he's brought back over and over so do you have any did you have any thoughts about that do you think having having read about the original production the, the reception was different or how it spoke to different ages? I, I think that's a really, thank you so much, that's a really challenging question. I mean, one thing in the libretto is there actually are alternate speeches at one point. He says this speech was written for the 1984 revival, so we're doing some changes here and there. And I think, um, I think you can't really ever revive something without changing it. Part of it is context. Part of it is in, um, you know, who are we reviving it for, whether it's ourselves or others. And, and Wilson seemed to be resisting that last night with Civil Wars, but clearly with, um, with Einstein, you know, for the Philip Glass celebration, they're doing it, they're gonna tour it around the world. I think, um, I'm gonna go back to BAM, but I think it's, it is all about context. It's about the fact that you're getting audience members like me who have listened to some Philip Glass, who've read about it, but who really haven't seen it before. And you're getting audience members like the experts on Wilson who are coming back and seeing it again. But also it's when it's staged. So in 2016, I saw, um, uh, Ivo van Hove's Kings of War on the same stage uh, at, uh, at BAM. And the New Yorker called that, it was um, called that the, the first great work of theater of the Trump era. And the thing is that van Hove had created that play in the Netherlands 
about half a decade earlier, maybe more. I think he created it in 2010, and that's November 2016 after the election that it's being staged there. But the New Yorker aligns that with the current politics because you can't help doing that. And so when we're seeing um, Einstein on the beach with a very visibly interracial cast, multiracial cast, I mean, that's something that Wilson has done with his work since the earliest days. And we see that during the Obama presidency, that's a very radically different thing than seeing that during the 1970s when you had um, you know, the Black Panthers taking over university spaces. So that context of the revival is everything. I'm not sure I answered your question, but you know, but yeah. I, I just wanted to add a short comment about revivals and it's just my observation, but it seems to me that Wilson very rarely revives theatrical productions, but he often revives operas. He has many operas that he has revived quite often through the years and then he usually revives them as a kind of like a museum piece. And Einstein was also revived as a kind of a museum piece, despite the small changes. I mean, you can even see that the racial casting was always the same in all the productions. So I think this is probably the reason why he revives Einstein, because opera is a, muse it is a museum drama, unlike theater. And I think that's probably how he thinks about it, though it's just, again, my observation. I mean, just if I can briefly respond, I think about also when I went to the Berliner Ensemble, in 2016 and saw a production of Mother Courage there um, that was a direct revival of Brecht's staging of Mother Courage, although the cart didn't work in the second act, which was one of the most Brechtian elements <laughs> in that they took a long intermission and then they came out before the second act and said, we're very sorry, the cart's not working. <laughs> But that was kind of a Brechtian element. But it felt like museum theater. Like, that's what it was. Yeah. I was going to a museum, I was going to a museum, not to the theater. And I was very aware of that, as opposed to everything else I saw in Berlin on that visit. This is more something that I'm going to throw out in the air, thinking about revivals um, and this work which we saw, which we didn't see the original of. And I think about the quality of light, and I think about the instruments of light, and I think about the programming of light, which was so different when it was first done. And even how performers can feel light now is different from how people were able to feel light in Wilson's original um, iteration of his of of, of this work. And so. One of the things that I keep thinking about with Wilson is how, like, is he painting differently potentially on the stage? Is there is there more precision that's happening? How what is his relationship with light? And so anyway, your 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 conversation today, your talk, just reminds me of that's another element for us to think about when we're thinking about these revival pieces. Yeah, I mean, can you not? The technology is changing. We, we were hearing about the Wooster Group earlier, and what they were doing in the 1980s was totally revolutionary, and now everyone uses projection. Everyone uses live feed camera in their, in their theater. I mean, Ivo van Hove felt radical in the early 2000s, 2010s, but he was doing what the Wooster Group had done and the technology makes that possible. I'm, I'm thinking about how I've changed all my lights in my house out to LEDs and like the quality of light is different and that's just technology, so yeah. I don't. I, sorry. Um, she asked, do I know what he used in terms of lighting and I don't, I don't yeah, know. I just asked if they try to revive museum -ly museum light. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me having looked at images from both if they tried, but that is a question of technology, of Well, the technology, the, the old technology still exists. Yeah. So they could do it. Yeah, you could, you could demand I want those I old, don't know either. I'm those old uh, you know, Fresnels and not the LEDs, but I, I don't know about that. That's, that's really cool. Sorry, I think we, uh, we will continue with our panel in a few minutes. And if you have questions, you can ask them there. Okay, yeah, okay, then that's...
But we also want to set up. Let's uh, okay. I say something about the lighting because um, he hates LID, Bob Wilson, and the German company has hired Bob Wilson to invent a kind of lighting like LSD, but with a different kind of effect of it. So he, he talked a long time about this at one of uh, our talks. Hmm? Wilson ha hates this, this light from LED. I said it, it's cold and he hates it. So a German company hired Wilson to help them to find an LED which has the effect of the warm light he likes. He likes. So he's working on this. It's just because you asked about just also very one fast comment. Uh, when they redid Einstein at BAM the last time, he did say the light doesn't look right, the warmth isn't there. It's like the old records where he said, you know, something got lost. He, and we, he said, we all forget, Einstein was a fully analog production. There was nothing digital in it. So he, as, a, as Jacques Rancière said, he anticipated the future, made us, you know, somehow aware, you know, what could be, but it was not a digital work. And now when it was digital, he felt something um, was missing. Um, I just want to say in relation to the lighting, uh, and particularly uh, to the two dance scenes, one of the uh, biggest changes I noticed as opposed to the original, as opposed to revival, I do, th although I think this was a change made for the 1992 revival, is that in color photos of the original for the dance scenes, you see this absolutely beautiful yellow light, just g or more golden, just flooding the stage, though it's more brown for the second dance. And now, of course, the lighting is much more sterile than the absolutely overflowing golden light you see or originally. So I, I just thought that might be relevant as far as lighting. Yeah, and, and, and this is a generational issue because for me, LED doesn't have that cold effect. Now, having stood under old fashioned stage lighting, I can tell you, you feel the warmth differently. And also having operated both a board where all you have to do is press go, and then suddenly the lighting changes versus one where you're frantically between each cue, adjusting all of the things to your cues, and then swapping over to the next one because you literally don't have it connected to a computer. Like, that is a radically different act as a board op than the stage manager says go. Stage manager says go. You know, it's, it's a physically different act. So thank you, thank you so much. I wish I had known more about this lighting, but I'm really delighted to learn so much through my paper. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for putting in that mic. Oh, of course. Oh, yes, of course, please. Sorry. this on okay now we continue with our panel um, I think these were all really interesting uh, presentations um, I think the way I would like to start is it, it was interesting that that we kind of related uh, Bob's work to Brecht and Otto and I would just like to uh, establish kind of a, the historical context perhaps because usually when we talk about Artaudian and um, Brechtian influences on experimental theater, let's say particularly of the 1960s and 1970s, what usually comes to mind is Peter Brooks, Marasad, the living theater, the performance group, um, and usually not really Bob's work. 
So even though we all kind of related, you know, his aesthetics to Brecht and or Artaud, um, the way I would like to start is how does Bob reference these aesthetics differently from his peers and contemporaries? Yeah, so obviously there are uh, Artaudian and Brechtian um, aspects to his work, but it's also very clear, and, and Bob himself always, you know, distance himself from the work of the living theater, open theater, etc. You know, what, what, what constitutes the, the very different reception of Brecht and Artaud in, uh, in Wilson's uh, production? I mean, I think what's interesting to start out is uh, three people who try to find an ecritius scenic to find just a new language for, st for the stage. Yeah. And uh, each one has found it with tiny little difference. I think, uh, I mean, I think it's clearer with, with, with Brecht than with Artaud and Wilson. And even so, the early Brecht had, th was absolutely influenced by surrealism, but Brecht had a really political idea which neither Pastor nor Wilson had. But I still think that um, Artaud really wanted to get people into a kind of trance stage, which I think Bob does not really want to do. He wants to affect them. He wants to sensi sensitize the body, but I don't think he wants to put them into hypnosis. I don't know, you can say it, yeah. So um, I think it really depends on, on the time period because uh, Wilson's work has changed a lot through the years. And I think in the very early years, if you actually read, it's kind of funny because now when you hear uh, Wilson talk like we did yesterday, it's always the same repertory of stories uh, that keep recurring. Uh, and it's always interesting to hear because he's very entertaining, but it's the same stories. Um, he's sort of like constructed a myth around himself and he keeps recounting it. Whereas in the early years, like in Stefan Brecht, you know, there are so many long transcriptions of conversations that he just had with Wilson, just completely uncut, which are very interesting. Because over there, you can see that actually in the early years, he did used to think about the audience as, he, he never used the word trance, but he believed that they would enter a kind of like a different state of consciousness through watching his performances. Um, so I think there was something a little bit like that. I would also like to refer to your question very briefly. And I think that the reason why people don't usually speak of Wilson in the context of Brecht and Artaud is because people usually find it very hard to do formal analysis. Even I think theater studies, we're still very much confounded by words. So when you have theater groups or directors who wrote a lot of theory and who in their theory referenced uh, Brecht and Artaud, then that gives scholars a very easy key or a tool to look at somebody's aesthetics and then analyze it under these keys. Whereas Wilson has never really formulated a, th uh, a theory and he probably didn't really know at all of Brecht when he started creating his theater. So you basically just have to look and through formal analysis sort of, um, uh, that's what most of us do today, uh, get into these kinds of parallels. And people usually find that more difficult. And I wanted to just shortly quote Wilson. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is that um, he was, um, he once said, why doesn't everybody, anybody look? Why doesn't anybody listen? Like if we would say in the program that the performance had 10 red elephants, everybody would write in the newspaper the next day that the performance had 10 red elephants, even if the elephants were white. And I think this is very much the issue, that it's really hard to look and, and to analyze um, for us as theater people, which I find surprising, but it's hard for us to do formal analysis. I mean, one, one of my takes on your question, Marcus, has to do with, uh, with training and acknowledgement. So last night when Wilson was talking about his influences, he went back to his college theater director and that production of Hamlet that he saw and not Arto and Brecht, even though he was subtly referencing them. And he said, if I'd gone to Yale, this would have been totally different. Now. I did go to Yale uh, undergrad, and so I sure was infused with Brecht and Grotowski and Artaud, and I learned about all those backwards and forwards. 
And I think about something like Elevator Repair Service, where John Collins, their artistic director, also went to Yale and has a very clear aesthetic that he's articulated in some ways, even though part of his aesthetic is every show we do is different, which isn't always true. But that aesthetic goes directly back to the Wooster group. And you look at the fact that Scott Shepard is often the lead or co-creator in some of his work. So he's very consciously part of this trajectory that Wilson seems to be at least overtly rejecting. Now, the, the problem is we're all able to talk about Artaud and Brecht and No, partially because that's got to be disingenuous to some degree as you're talking about the stories that he's telling because he's part of the avant-garde scene in New York in the 60s and 70s. So, of course, he's getting infused with Brecht and Artaud and Grotowski and Artaud via Grotowski. So it's, so it's you know... It's, it's you, you get it even if you don't 100% know you're getting it. I, I wanted to come back to actually Stefan Brecht because Stefan Brecht very much describes um, Wilson's uh, you know, early work um, as a cult. And so I, I talked about you know, the, the, this uh, notion of awareness that he kind of wants to achieve. Um, but, but there's a certain uh, description in, uh, in, in Stefan Brecht's book uh, where the awareness finally is actually really the uh, awareness of a kind of a, a deeply spiritual as well as physical level, really all almost of a cosmic energy flow. So, so the, the creativity of, of the, the performers on stage and the audiences almost kind of, m you know, mimic, mimicry level identifica identification with that physicality makes them aware or gets them into sync with that kind of cosmic energy. I mean, that's only one, one passage. I mean, you know, there are many different uh, ways of, of how Bre Stefan Brecht kind of uh, addresses this. Uh, but, but to me, you know, there is kind of an Atodian element in, in, in that particular kind of analysis of, of Bob's early work. And my, my takes to, the, to your question is it seems that um, what marks um, Bob's work different from the 60s avant-garde and also even to Brecht and Arto is that it seems there's a very classical dimensions deep inside Bob's work, while on the other hand is in opposition to his very forward-going aesthetics. So these oppositions um, make it different because that emphasis on the classical dimension, which he also talked about yesterday night. Yeah. Um, the, yeah. So I, I will just rem uh, remember that when Heimer Müller had his 60th birthday, there was his wish was that Bob talks about his development. And uh, it was in East Germany at the time. And it was a four hour talk because it had to be translated also. And I think his main influences were Cunningham and Balanchine, and who, Bal who did not talk about Brecht at all at his, at his, um, at his death. He didn't talk about Arthur either. So, <laughs> so, so I think one, one thing that I w w where I see a strong similarity between Artaud and, uh, and, 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 and Bob's work is really the... Uh, so Artaud... For example, when he went to the World Ex Exposition in Paris, uh, you know, analyzing Balinese theater, it was actually a particular Balinese form called Le Gong. Um, and uh, Ato actually misinterpreted right. the sign language of this yeah. form by somehow claiming it is basically the, the dancers use uh, a sign language without any significance. It doesn't have any meaning, mm -hmm. uh, but these signs they, 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 they um, transport, convey a certain level of in, in, uh, intensity without uh, having any kind of significance, which, which is really completely not true if you, if you, if you read up on, on this particular tr uh, tradition. Yeah. Uh, and in a certain way, um, Wilson, of course, um, also kind of generates, or is very particular, uh, of obviously, about, you know, even kind of minute movements of, you know, fingers. Um, so, so it's, a, you know, he, he's developed a very um, stark kind of gestural, gestural language, but it's also up to the audience to somehow 
read or interpret that. And I think in terms of the clarity of gestural, theatrical, sign language, um, and I mean, of course, b b in Otto's case, it was kind of a misreading, but Otto himself also kind of envisioned a, a sign language that would not convey meaning, but convey a certain intensity that would kind of affect the audience at, at a deeper, I don't know, almost kind of neurological, neurophysical level. I mean, that, that connects to a bit of a wrench that I wanted to throw into this, which is a little ironic coming from, more than a little ironic, coming from a cis white man, but Artaud doesn't just misinterpret the Lagang, he dehumanizes them, he calls them robotic. And so it's this otherizing of uh, foreigners coming in and doing this cultural dance. And I think Brecht does a similar amount of otherizing when he writes on the Chinese theater and his take on that for the alienation effect. And uh, if I remember correctly, Jill Dolan uh, in The Feminist Spectator as Critic really highlights Wilson, Foreman, and Schechner as these artists who are positioning the masculine as the subject and the feminine as the object throughout their work. So there does seem to me to be a bit of a track of, um, you know, patriarchal cultural imperialism that runs through all three that we have to acknowledge and sort of deal with in some way, shape, or form. Yeah, I, yeah that's probably true to a certain extent. I mean, that there's an, un, uh, I'm not sure about Bob's work. I mean, he's, but, he's but trying but not but to. If you look we at, uh, yeah. of course, uh, it, I mean, that's definitely the case in w with regard to Brecht's early work. Uh, and I I I I'm not so sure if it's that, that gendered. I mean, the other ring that we kind of see in, in Atoll's misreading uh, of, uh, you know, um, Le Gong, um, and, and, and Brecht at least did see a lecture demonstration of Mylon Fang in Moscow in 1935. So it's not that this is not based on an actual kind of viewing experience. Um, and of course, perhaps di also different from Atto, Brecht doesn't quite present himself as the expert on Chinese theater, it's just he sees something that allows him to articulate his own notion of estrangement better. But of course, there's always a, a problematic aspect in terms of it is, of course, the, the, you know, the Westerner with more cultural, political, economic power um, analyzing these kind of non-Western forms. And you don't get much in terms of a, you know, it's 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 very one-sided in that regard, and that's uh, that's of course always kind of the key issue. So I I totally agree with what you said, um, and I also refer to that briefly in my talk that Otto definitely misinterpreted what he saw. However, I think that for Wilson's theater, what's actually important is the formal side of things, and I think that because Otto didn't understand the context and he focused on the form and he sort of like interpret that to the best of his ability with the tools that he had. And there is something, um, I played in a gamelan orchestra for two years, so I'm very <laughs> familiar with uh, Balinese performance. And there is something very, very trance-inducing about these kinds of rhythms. And, and so even if you don't really understand it, then it, do it, it does do something to your body, which is, which is very physical. And I think that this is actually, in, in my mind, um, the important takeaway. And one must always, always remember also the misinterpretations, especially because it's culturally problematic, but still, the formal aspects, I think, remain valid, even if both Brecht and Otto misinterpreted certain things. And I wanted to also get back to your comment about influences. And I, I completely agree that I don't think, I think I also said that in my talk, that um, Wilson did not know Brecht, did not know Otto, definitely not in the early years of his work. However, like you also said, he recognizes certain influences, not many. Kate Cunningham, uh, Martha Graham, Isadora Duncan, and um, Balanchine are usually the, the main people he would recognize. And I just wanted to remind us that Cade was actually the one who got Arthur translated into English and his ideas disseminated. And so through Cade, who was a huge influence on Wilson, Wilson did get some Arthurian ideas. And also Isadora Duncan was, I think, more important to Wilson than people usually remember. But he actually uh, quotes extensively in the program of Daphne and Grant. He quotes from The Dance of the Future. 
And the passages that he quotes, and actually if you also go back to Isadora Duncan, I mean, it's completely uh, Wagnerian, Nietzschean um, concepts. So um, I think through like these kinds of American influences, we did get some sort of these, this tradition of total theater coming in from Europe did um, sit into his early work. I, I mean, I want to follow up to what you just said, but also because we had a similar conversation yesterday afternoon on the, the panel yesterday afternoon. I, th I think it's an academic fallacy uh, of always somehow expecting that the artists that you're analyzing have read the same books that, that you have read to interpret their work. Okay. Um, I, th I think that that is, you know, I mean, there is, there's no reason why uh, Wilson or any of his contemporaries would have had to read Artaud or Brecht to then somehow feature Brechtian or Artaudian char characteristics in their work. I mean, it's just, you know, it comes with our field somehow that we, that we kind of expect uh, artists that we like or whose, you know, whose aesthetics we kind of like that we just kind of assume they must have you know, been kind of subjected to the same sources. Um, but of often certain aesthetics or ideas develop in the, uh, we, we see those connections, we establish those constellations, but that doesn't mean that the respective uh, artists that we're kind of discussing must have basically uh, been subjected to, to the same material. I want to come back to the notion of repetition, actually. Um, so the idea to what, uh, ex you know, I mean, the idea, that, or the question to what, you know, repetition can still involve change. And I think it's, of course, then, of course, you're in a completely different territory, then you're talking about kind of Nietzsche, and you're talking about Gilles Deleuze's difference and repetition, I, you know, which is, of course, kind of a key text of, of French post-structuralism. And of course, the, 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 the Deleuze's notion is, of course, that n n no repetition can ever exactly be the same. Uh, uh, difference is already kind of written into repetition. Yeah, so, so repetition does not exclude change. Uh, I think that that's really kind of Im Im important because we often kind of assume that that that's, you know, repetition just mean there is no, no development, there's no kind of learning curve, there's nothing new emerging out of repetition, but that's uh, also I, I, was, I was thinking of Judith Butler. I mean, basically, she taught us that repetition is always a source of subversion. So if you repeat something, you can always subvert it. I mean, it never repeats exactly the same. I think when we talk about Wilson, we also, we talk about Chef Chefnau first. But for me, something is also Hamlet Nessim, for instance. We have, if my students would have gone to Could Turkey, you closer to it, the first North American um, production of Hamlet Nessim. And I dramaturged it. And you know the three pages of text is the whole history and literature and so on. I was working for a whole year on the thing. And then I saw <laughs> Wilson's production. And I called Heiner Müller and said, this guy hasn't, hasn't gotten anything. <laughs> And then Heiner Müller said, you go back and watch it five times and then we have another talk. And I did. And now I honestly think it's the best interpretation of Hamlet Machine I have ever seen. But it's not the gestures, it's really images he creates, which are all somehow in the text. And these images are so, uh, they still haunt me after 16 or 20 years now, you know. And I think. This is also one of Wilson's, as uh, you talked about Chef Chef, that the images he creates are just really precise. And uh, not when you expect them in the text, but they're all in the text somewhere. I mean, perhaps appropriately for something like repetition in Einstein on the beach, I think it can be useful to go back to science. So, I mean, Carlson and Susan Bennett are great thinking about theater audiences and reception and how we look again at things. But I'm thinking also about like Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. You can't look at something without affecting it. So who's looking, how you're looking, when you're looking, changes it. And that's, you know, that's just a scientific principle about looking at atoms, but it certainly applies to looking at the theater on stage too. 
I'm thinking more about um, what kind of frame that make us see something as moving forward and what kind of frame that makes us see things that is repeating. Because if you just compare things that is very similar or the same, there's always differences, but it's about the frame. Even when we're walking, if we just talk, look at the legs, then they're repeating. But if we have another frame, it is moving forward. So for example, in the work of uh, Wilson's, I see that maybe it's about the frame that is deconstructed. Mm -hmm. So we don't have the frame that make us see things moving forward. There's no action line. There's so we s w our perception is redirected towards the gesture or the movement that highlights the repetition and we downplay the perceptions of the differences there. So, yeah, I think there's some kind of operations there. So I wanted to come back to Atto just, uh, just for a second. So, so Atto, of course, is really the, he really hates repetition. So the theater of cruelty is basically a theater, uh, you know, a, a performance not to, rep to, re to repe re repeat it ever. Um, and that's, that's, of course, one of the major sh theoretical challenges, what this actually means for, uh, of course, uh, you, you know, uh, the, the French word for, for rehearsal is repetition. Um, so repetition is kind of literally built into, you know, con more conventional understandings of theater. Um, but, but that's of course kind of a key aspect of, uh, of, 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 of a toll that's that has remained challenging, I think, for any kind of theater artist. Um, but there is something about, you know, the notion of, of, of cruelty, which has been so often misinterpreted, particularly by, by other theater artists in the 1960s, because it's not really about violence, it's not about sadomasochism, uh, it's about a rigor that we have towards ourself uh, in, uh, with regard to breaking through, through all of our you know, um, uh, screens of socialization. I mean, it's, it's really the theater of cruelty is about getting to our core being in, in a certain way. And I think you could make a strong case that that's really also something that's really at, at the heart of Bob's work. Yeah, and, 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 and to get there is exactly not through, you know, the conventional histrionics representation of emotion, naturalism, uh, you know, uh, realistic psychology, but, but really by other means. Um, and that's, of course, where you have, you know, the use of space, the use of time in a way, um, in, in a non-realistic uh, sense to open up that space where we might actually also <laughs> discover this rigor that allows us to to go deeper. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm thinking about how in I think it's the introduction to the theater and his double, but it's somewhere in there. He's very clear the double is not real life, and it's also not the dream life of the surrealists. It's something else. It's something deeper and more honest that's a part of us that we have to get to. That's, for him, what the theater is trying to double. And as an undergraduate, I sort of saw, this is really fun to talk about in my theater history class, I sort of saw an avant-garde troupe do The Spurt of Blood, which is an impossible play to do. And they acknowledged that, and they sort of also acknowledged Artaud might not want us to do this play that you know we're not really supposed to do because it's now a masterpiece, so don't do it. So I would like to open it up perhaps uh, to questions from the audience. Is there any questions to the panel? Um, I want to go back to something you said early on about um, cult, like that, you know, the Wilson, cult, the early on in particular, there was literally, he had disciples, and I saw the documentary Absolute Wilson years ago when it came out. And I was more in focused on his work, and I remember my I don't know I haven't seen it since, but my memory or my feeling was a sense of betrayal by those non actors who were part of the Bird Hoffman school of birds, and how when he went to professional actors, like they felt there was like a betrayal of them. Uh, so the sense of cult, but because we're looking at Arto and Brecht uh, as well, maybe you mentioned Brooke. There's a sense of cult with all with. Well, maybe less with Artaud, but with the other ones of, there is a sense of a cult, that people would go visit the Berliner Ensemble, 
and they'd go see Brecht's production. They would sit in on the rehears his open rehearsals. Um, Peter Brook as well. People like travel the world to see these productions. Uh, and there's a sense of, you saw that Wilson thing. You saw, like, the, the sense of cult, not just of the people who were part of it, but in the audiences who follow, who connect to the work. There's a specific audience who connect, I think, to Wilson's work. I mean, first, first I would say, if you look at the 1960s, 1970s, you know, I mean, uh, <laughs> I mean, the notion of cult, you, I mean, it's, it's probably also that era, you know, you look at the performance group, you look at Grotowski, you look at uh, Eugenio Barber, I mean, even the way these, you know, usually kind of male, white directors, uh, you know, uh, fashion themselves, um, almo almost as, you know, kind of gurus wi within there. But I'm, I'm not so sure that this, this actually really applies to Bob. But of course, uh, that, that of course also, you know, would start a completely different discussion about to what extent art, of course, is also kind of a, a substitute for, for religion. Or, I mean, there, there's of course, uh, I, I mean, we talked about, you know, the notion of spirituality came, came up repeatedly already, you know, in, uh, in the last one and a half day, uh, days. And of course, there's something so special about certain artists. Uh, artists, that of course, they kind of follow follow their work. I'm not sure that the word cult is the appropriate word, um, but of course sometimes art gives us something so special and we can only get it from these special artists um, that of course, you know, we go out of our way, um, for example, to travel to a conference like this here <laughs> in, in New York City to, to talk about that, that kind of work. But, but I'm not so sure, um, I, I wouldn't always state perhaps the cult-like dimension of what perhaps even we right now are kind of engaging in. <laughs> um, can I just say, I actually think it was um, pretty close to a cult in the early years. And I would make a distinction here between the experience of the audience, uh, whether uh, the audience that went to see Wilson's productions or the audience that goes to the Berlin Ensemble or to Bayreuth. Uh, um, I think that for the group, for the Bird Hoffman School of Birds, the amateurs that gathered around Wilson, especially because they were not professional actors, but if you could argue that if you're a professional actor who goes to work with a certain director, you do that in order to evolve in your profession. Um, but for Wilson, the people that gathered around him and that acted in the silent operas, all the productions between 68 and 73, five years, they were amateurs, they had no training in theater, and they basically just stopped their entire lives, moved into Wilson's loft, spent 24 hours a day only working on his productions, for his productions, making the costumes, making the sets, creating almost impossible things, and performing in these pieces. And that basically, uh, there's a quote, I don't remember it exactly, in, in Stefan Brecht's uh, book where he says that um, this became their life. I mean, there was basically nothing else for them. Uh, only the group, nothing else happened. If they had a life partner, it, it would be somebody from the group. There was nothing outside the group. And then in 73, when he said, okay, um, everybody, you can just go back home. I'm, I want to do something else. A lot of them had tremendous difficulties just picking up their lives. I mean, they just stopped their lives and for five years they did nothing but devote themselves to his work. So I think it is actually very close to a cult. Um, I'm not an expert on cults, <laughs> but it, it's not, yeah, it's, it's very unusual. But Stefan Brecht also called the birds a particularly untalented group of people. Yeah. And, you know, and it's, it's, it's just because of their involvement with Bob um, that he was able to, to use these peculiarly ungifted people to create great theater. Yeah. And, and, and none of those, uh, you know, m n none of the members of this group probably would have excelled as performers in the work, you know, in productions of any other contemporary director, I mean, according to Stefan Brecht. So there's also, they got a certain recognition. Yeah, they got um, it, but I don't think that yeah. they, like, he also, Stefan Brecht, sorry, this is kind of turning to a Stefan Brecht uh, discussion, but he also refers to the performances as the highlights of, of their daily life. So basically it was just a whole process, especially because, as you mentioned also in your talk, the materials really recycled themselves from one production to another. So they basically just did rehearsals for an extended period of time, and every now and then they had performances, which was just part of this daily existence. And it wasn't actually very important, I think, for most of them, because um, some of them did go on to become uh, professional artists after working with Wilson, but for a lot of them it had more, I think, of a psychological meaning, just working with the group. 
I mean, this, this is part and parcel of the theater of the 1960s. I think of the actors going to the laboratory theater in Poland and running yeah. through the forest at night, or, uh, or, or the bread and puppet theater, you know, moving out to the country and making bread and giant puppets, or Frank brought um, Judith Molina and the Living Theater to, uh, to the Grad Center back in the day, and I met an actor and spoke with him from the company, and it felt like that was his life still, the Living Theater. But I think one thing you said, Marcus, is really important to acknowledge is that we're moving out of a period where all of the nonprofit theater has been a sort of a cult because we're getting that movement of pay your artists, pay your artists a living wage. We don't, you know, we do love what we do as artists or academics, but we have to be paid a living wage. And that's a key part of what a cult is, isn't it? That you love something so much that you don't need the material things in life. And we're, we're moving out of that in the nonprofit theater. But that's also because the social economic conditions are radically different from the 1970s where you could, could rent a loft well, you could, you could, you know, you could, you could buy a loft for relatively little money and basically, you know, have a low-paying job and still be able to somehow produce work. That's, of course, absolutely no longer possible in New York City. It may still be more possible in places, for example, like Berlin, no but in the United no States, longer no longer. Yeah. But, 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 you know. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's a fantastic article, but but I, thi I, but I think it's Im important that the entire social, economic, political framework has changed so dramatically. You know that that that's of course really kind of it's yeah. it's from it's from a decade ago. It's from before this movement. It was either the New York Times or the Village Voice. But a major off Broadway actor, Nick Westrate, wrote an article about how he acted in major off Broadway plays for 52 weeks out of the year. He didn't take a vacation, and this was in the off-Broadway nonprofit theater, and then he declared bankruptcy because he had been moving his money from one credit card debt to another while acting in productions that everyone in New York had seen. Sorry, I just don't want us to conflate off-Broadway with off-off-Broadway or with ensemble theater. They're totally different ecosystems. They're totally different ways of making art. They're totally different ways of engaging with each other. And so I think to, to start to talk about off-Broadway and, and uh, the off-off, it, it's, it's, it's apples and oranges. Um, and th the other thing that I was going to share is I also think that within the framing of how we're thinking about Wilson, right, there is in the, the 60s, you could talk, we can talk about Wilson and we can talk about Foreman, we can talk about formalism, we can talk about the stage and you can bring in Cunningham to that as well. So when th the original conversation at the top of this panel of like thinking about how we're, how and where Wilson fits into this legacy, it, it, it is, it does exist. It's just that there's been this uh, focus on the actors and the performers, and 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 more of that kind of social uh, configuration of working versus this formalism way of working on the stage. So I just want to like bring that forward. Yeah, thank you for that distinction. It's okay. I can. Well, should all, all come to Philadelphia for a cheaper place rather than New York, <laughs> where, where I live. Uh, thank you for this wonderful panel and discussion. Very also uh, present. Uh, I just want to go uh, back a little bit to yesterday because this morning the word post-traumatic did not was not used, uh, and and Lema, th th which is actually very interesting because, of course, uh, 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 Bob emerges as so prismatic. You know, there are so many ways now, after two half days, to to look at objects. So my, uh, I suggest two ways. Um, maybe in th we can introduce if we wish, the, um, the work of Lema, who was here in mm -hmm. 2018, I remember, on this stage. One is uh, uh, for Marcus, is there a way, you know, your title is Reviewing Stefan Brecht uh, in light of uh, uh, Bertolt Brecht. And can we, is it possible to review Lema in light of Stefan Brecht? Is there, is there, what is the connection? Right, I know, it, it is kind of a, but w uh, w uh, since we are looking at genealogies of scholarship, 
uh, this relationship, I'm interested in that relationship between, between what which we generated some discussion when Lehman published the book. So where, uh, and Lehman we know was here, was, was influenced by, by Wilson, we, we talked that. And the second is instead for uh, Pia and, 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 and Larry, um, when you mentioned the political and the non-political, this is one of Lehman's points, you know, how to relate the political. And what you said about uh, the Trifani opera reminded me of the work of Castellucci, who was also here, by the way, <laughs> in 2016, I think. And, and what is the, w w we haven't really talked about Bob and, and the political and the non-political, but, but Lehman poses this problem. And, uh, and of course, Brecht too, and, and Lehman was a Brecht scholar. So I, what I'm asking is that is if any of you can, can trace some threads between... Okay, uh, okay let me start, problems. but I will start with partially responding to your second question. Because there is a link between Stefan Brecht's discussion of Bob's relationship to language and the notion of the political and post-traumatic theater. Um, so, so Lehmann's take on the political in theater, or what constitutes the political in theater, is often controversial because, you know, he d <laughs> he derives this notion very much from Julia Kristeva. So, so to him, a theater that refuses the propositionality of language is political, and a, a you know, and an outspoken message-driven message political theater that claims to p be political is of no interest to Lehmann as political theater. So even what interests him, him, him in Brecht is not the overt leftist politics of, of, uh, of Brecht, but how Brecht himself also undermines this, how he plays with language, how he literally kind of estranges even that aspect of his politics. And interestingly, um, Stefan Brecht actually has a, a discussion uh, about um, Bob's skepticism towards exactly the proposition, propositionality of language, which is one of the reasons why the early Wilson, according to Stefan Brecht, doesn't really want to use language because language always you know, tends towards making, producing fixed meaning. Yeah, and, 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 and so you have this, you have, you, have a, you have a certain correspondence basically between Lehmann's reference to Kristeva and then uh, Stefan Brecht's kind of discussion of uh, Bob's deep, 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 deep distrust of language uh, at the beginning of his, of his artistic career. Thank you. Just add something with regards to that. I mean, I see actually see a very significant uh, connection between um, the use of Christian and Autodian aesthetics in the post-traumatic theater. And I think if you look at um, that has actually been established many many years ago. If you look at um, Andre Wirth, who was Lehmann's teacher, has like short and brilliant texts. So one of them is about how post-Brechtian aesthetics has basically become the language of the what he called then the new theater, which we Lehman would later call the post-traumatic theater. And um, that basically it, it involves a kind of like a radicalization of Brechtian aesthetics, on but on the formal level. So this very much, I think, um, characterizes a lot of the post-traumatic theater, and that sort of like um, delineates at least the relationship to Brecht. And I think um, the political and the non-political things is, um, on the one hand, is a, it could be a paradox because of the language. And, but uh, from through the work of the three pennies, um, when Wilson's aesthetics and Bragg's narrative intervene or disturbing each other, I find um, it is precious to open up a space that we can really reflect about these two terms. For ex uh, especially, for example, compare with many other productions of three penny operas when we um, when people s started to produce it in a way that make it really political or socio-political compare with Wilson's version it seems like something is missing there and and I that's why I, I, I in the paper I would call it the non-political get a chance to come out again and also 
in related to reality when, for example, compared with the experience living in a more totalitarian um, scenarios or when a kind of social situation, everything is politicalized, you f um, the experience, living experience there would be like, okay, the life experience is flattened, it's become just flat. And it seems that that kind of political experience is excluding something that's es essential in life that I would call it also the non-political. Well, I mean, the Wilson's three penny because the, the two aesthetic system interview each other. So these kind of non-political dimensions come out again and, and the dialectics between these two become m moving again. That, and which interestingly that I would see is as what Brett warned, this kind of movement, dialectical movement. I just want to finish this, but it, it, uh, we had in 1986, we brought the Berliner Ensemble Three Penny Opera to, to Toronto, first time to North America. And I find the Wilson's, um, and, and of course what the Berliner Ensemble did at the time was so anti brechtian I mean, Brecht said, you know, history is changing, you have to change your production and your means of production the way you do it all the time. And to bring Brecht as a museum piece, uh, for me, is the most unbrechtian thing you can do. And I, I find, for instance, the uh, Wilson production with the Wilson combination with Brecht is much more political and more interesting than the Berliner Ensemble production from 1986. And uh, just one quote from Aristotle, for example, when he say, uh, when he say um, human being is political animal, on the one hand, it's a political statement, but on the other hand, it's metaphysical for him, it's ontological. So the political and the non-political is complicated there. And th th there's also a famous quote from Heiner Müller that's relevant. Heiner Müller who said, using Brecht or working with it without criticizing and changing its treason. Yeah. 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 And I think this goes, this goes here, yeah. I think one thing to think about Lehman is, I mean, that was one of the first uh, the first works I read in grad school, the translation was what, 2004, 2005? So, mm -hmm. so 20 years ago. And I, I think there's been a move back towards the dramatic theater since then. I think of, if you look at Marvin's 10,000 Nights and the, the sequel that the Siegel Center just published of theater, um, you know, up through the plague, so his memoir vis-a-vis -vis theater, you see how you see how we've moved back towards the text, like Elevator Repair Service right after the layman is published starts doing gaps and it selects The Sun Also Rises and, um, and the, the Sound and the Fury and just now Ulysses. So, so we're moving back to text in a way. And again, this is a sort of a cyclical thing, a repetition. I, w I, w I, w I would make a strong case for Gatz being a key example of post-dramatic theater. Yes. Because first, it's not a dramatic text. Uh, it, it is really about playing with time to have a nine-hour performance of the novel with one actor having memorized the whole thing, uh, setting it within you know some kind of office party setting. Um, I, I would. I mean, it's about text. I mean, and you know, like Lehman's example for post-romantic theater with regard to Bob's work is his Hamlet monologue. So, so, so Sarah Kane, for example, is a key example for post-romantic uh, contemporary playwright. So, post-romantic theater does not mean that you no longer that you're no longer enga engaging with texts, but you engage with texts just in a very, very different way. But but the problem okay, but the notion of post dramatic theater only makes sense if you take into account how how what definition of drama Lehman uses in the first place. And he uses Peter Sondi's notion of drama, which he elaborates on, you know, in the, the theory theory of modern drama, and it's a very, very specific historical time frame. Uh it's it's really kind of uh 
uh, 17th century to 19th century. It's 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 very very specific what 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 Lehmann understands, uh, you know, uh, the word drama to mean. For example, for Lehmann, there, you know, there there there's pre-dramatic theater, there's dramatic theater, and post-dramatic theater. Uh, he's he's written books on all three different forms of drama, and for example, you know the cl a classical Greek tragedies and comedies for him are not drama; they're kind of pre-dramatic with regard to that particular definition of drama. So, staging a novel uh, by uh, you know uh, Scott Fitzgerald is most certainly not that's most certainly not uh, dramatic material, and and and, the, and 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 how it's been staged and and recontextualized really kind of ma in the, the use of space and time uh, really kind of makes it an example of uh, post-traumatic theater, even in, in Lehmann's own terms. And it's the form. It's the form of a novel. Yeah, and I think just very shortly that uh, theater as an art usually evolves historically a little bit later after other arts. So I think if you look at dance, you had postmodern dance and then post-postmodern dance, which wasn't actually a return to modernist dance, was kind of like a reinterpretation of what happens after that. And I think in theater, we're sort of like reaching the same place only a few decades later. Yeah, and I, I think just to in interfere, Hans Dieslehmann, who was here, his last public talk he did in the Americas, um, he said one of his great regrets was that it's misunderstood that it was against text, mm. that it was against writing, he said, the work of the Winnie Polish, of Carol Churchill, Sarah Kane, Jelinek, mm. uh, and so many others are kind of a different way of working with the text that opens uh, the space. So um, I think, uh, and with Gatsby, these are, I think, all examples. And I think um, uh, Wilson, of course, you know, is someone who says, just listen to the text on its own, right? Uh, he, Donald Judd, he spoke about the minimalist who said, let's just show the structure of wood or steel, you know, without commenting. We don't have to manipulate it like Michelangelo did with bronze, but we could look at the modern piece of a square and experience it. And I think um, uh, Bob most probably is the most uh, foremost, you know, uh, and kind of avant-gardist who really opened up in all directions, 360, um, what he did. But I would like really to say also in the memory of Hans Tieselmann that it is really wrong, completely wrong to say that it's not drama, it was always. He said that theater is a museum and has many rooms of a first. And then he said his idea of a post traumatic is a new way of thinking um, about theater. So and even our post-traumatic uh, post panel yesterday was about Wilson's productions of a, of a Strindberg, of an Ibsen. It's, I mean, so, so even the examples that we discussed yesterday were post-traumatic stagings of dramatic texts, yeah. I just wanted to add, following Karen, that I think the, first the early work of, Wil of Wilson relates to a not post-dramatic, but the rift between the visual arts and the theat theatricality. And he was trying to avoid theatricality more than drama. I'm thinking of Rosalind Price writing about theatricality of sculpture and as and the classical forms are the things that really re ties together with our show and Brecht more than the dramatic or post-dramatic work. Perhaps one more question from <laughs> the audience be before we wrap it up. So I, I would say uh, I can't answer that question directly, but I would want to point out 
that when the living theater toured Germany in the late 60s, 1970s, they were largely rejected because of that historical association. So the, so the response in the United States was radically different from what they first encountered in Germany, Paradise Now, be, be, be because there was a sense that theater as a cult might be politically really, you know, reactionary and, and problematic. Can I just jump in one quick thing? So uh, maybe, because we're going to post, we're talking about Lehman a lot, maybe it would actually be more interesting to start to talk about his last work, Tragedy and, dra and Dramatic Theater, um, in Wilson's work versus the post-dramatic, because there, there the, 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 it, he, as he's breaking down structure and form, he's, he, he, the, the idea of the experiential keeps coming forward over and over and over again. And uh, so I think that there's something about Wilson and the experiential in Lehman that could be really interesting to, to think about. Great suggestion for a different panel. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. <laughs>